romantic fantasy novella, The Tyrant's Favorite, and this is the guy Croft, and he is the main character of the story who has an attractive face. A young girl, arriving at the estate where she is going to work, turns to the young guy calling her name Riviera Blanche. Looking at the guy, the girl doesn't understand what the point is in a body that looks good. Riviera thought that she would be killed anyway. The unlucky Prince Croft, at the age of seven, was expelled by the previous emperor, which is why he spent 17 years on the eastern border of a lawless world. Duke Blanche helped Croft regain his throne after the death of the previous emperor. However, the duke wanted to become the new emperor's father-in-law. Therefore, Croft arrived at his estate a week before the coronation to learn etiquette. However, due to his studies, Croft accidentally met the duke's daughter, Princess Riviere Blanche. But in contrast to Duke Blanche's expectations, the mad tyrant Croft destroyed him first. The man finished off and plunged into eternal sleep just to be with the heroine. A woman reads that the author wants to destroy all empires just so that the two main characters can get together. The girl realizes that just a week ago she woke up in a novel she had recently read. The young lady, comparing her memories with the surrounding environment, remembers that when the girl was lying in bed, a maid came into her room and worriedly asked if the lady had woken up. The main character understands that she has become Riviere Blanche, a victim of tyranny. Croft is a man who is destined to become a tyrant, and before he got to the Imperial Palace, he came to stay in the Duchy of Blanche. Riviera Blanche is the only legitimate daughter of the Blanche family. The girl asks what is the use of status, beauty, and unrivaled power. While in the room with the prince, the young lady thought that she would soon die anyway, and she was very scared. The prince thought about becoming an emperor. He needed to know imperial etiquette. However, they sent a woman who is afraid of even his glance, the young man claims that he was not warned that he would be given the duke's daughter as an etiquette teacher. The young lady, turning to the prince, says that she will do everything in her power to help him. Croft thought that different things had been said about this girl, but she really was extremely elegant. However, the young master thought that the girl should be scared enough for her to run away. Riviera looked at the guy and realized that his eyes spoke better than any words. However, the prince insists that she teach him, and if the young lady makes a mistake, she will die. The lady offers to talk about their schedule. However, the prince yawns and does not listen at all to what the teacher tells him. Riviera asks why now. The girl wonders what's wrong with this guy. However, he can finish her off even now. The teacher thinks that probably he was not taught that he should not put his feet on the table and should respect others. However, no one cares because they will die at his hands anyway. The main character asks you whether he asked you to teach her. Because the girl was afraid of dying all week, and she doesn't understand whether he's a tyrant or just crazy, the teacher made a decision. Since she had no longer found a way to change the terrible future, the day should simply be forgotten for everything. The young lady kicked the prince with all her might and out of the table. However, the guy looked at her angrily and asked if she had hit him now. The girl calmly replies that it is not right for the emperor to put his feet on the table. The prince asks the young lady if she is speaking because she believes that he is not worthy to be emperor. The main character replies that if his majesty is not satisfied with her teaching method, then he can simply ask for another teacher. And she is confident that her father will gladly fulfill his request. The young lady thought about what would happen if she disappointed everyone around her and the emperor wanted to abandon her. The prince will ask for a new teacher and leave the estate, and maybe then she will survive. The girl intends to do what she thought because she must try. The prince looks at the teacher and does not understand why she is laughing. Croft has thought about the girl's words and decides to say no. Hearing about this, the young lady wondered why he was saying that. The prince replies that he wants to see her abilities as an etiquette teacher, and he claims that he doesn't need another teacher. The concerned young lady says that since they have little time, she will teach His Majesty only the most necessary manners and rules of etiquette. The teacher says that there are many tasks and little time, so she asks her to understand that the course of study can be difficult and rigorous. Croft says that he cannot promise that he will be an obedient student, but they need mutual understanding. Rivera says that if His Highness understands that the border residents call him a complete bastard, he should still pull himself together and study hard to change the opinions of others. The prince thought that no matter how smart the princess was, it seemed like she didn't understand anything and he would have to give the girl a warning. Croft asks the princess if she doesn't understand that the value of her life is no different from the value of the life of any other woman in this building. 
the teacher says, turning to the prince, that such jokes leave an unpleasant impression. His Highness replies that he is just joking because it seems to him that they had a misunderstanding. The main character asks the question, would it bother me if everyone thought of Emperor Lewin as a man who kills people left and right? The prince jumps out of his chair and sits down next to the princess. He touches her chin and says that they have yet to find out whether this is a misunderstanding or the truth. The girl, plucking up courage, pushes the prince away and slaps him in the face with her hand. The teacher makes comments that his highness should not touch a woman's body. The young lady said that since the welcome lesson was over, he would allow his highness to depart. Walking out the door, the main character thought that she had gone crazy. However, she had no reason to be this mad dog, destined to become a tyrant. The girl remembers that he came very close to her, and that's why her heart almost jumped out of her chest. Riviera says that she didn't think that the boxing lessons from her past life would be useful to her. Sitting outside the door, the young lady thinks that the prince will not try to stop her. The maid asks the mistress what happened to her right hand. The girl replies that it is just a small bruise, and for her, it is nothing. The maid thought that according to rumors, the prince was a crazy border dog, and he must have been able to bite her mistress. However, no matter how beautiful the princess is, her body is rather weak. The princess thought that if she made a little more effort, she could win. Sitting in his office, the prince says the more he thinks about it, the more absurd it seems to him. Croft claims that as soon as Riviere, the duke's daughter, entered the room, he immediately understood all her motives. However, he would be an idiot if he could not see between the lines the desire to arrange their wedding. The prince argues that the girl is simply incredibly beautiful, and he was planning to get married anyway, and to be honest, he wanted to avoid etiquette lessons. Suddenly a man enters the room and screaming asks if the prince really hit Miss Blanche. The gentleman asks what kind of fables he is talking about. A man in a white shirt asks if this is true. However, the captain would never raise his hand to a woman. Prince Jack for Blake to explain. The blonde guy says that recently two knights from the estate challenged him to a duel. And during this duel, he learned that the captain had attacked Miss Blanche. And of course, unlike Melick, he didn't answer them anything. Croft, holding his hand near his forehead, tells them to fall down. Melick, turning to the captain, says that he would never believe these rumors. The captain replies that he was not hers, however. The man in the white shirt says that he knew so because he always trusted the captain. Black asks why this rumor started. The prince claims that the attempt on the princess's life is a serious charge, and he could get into trouble, especially since it was her that was attempted there. Surprised, Blake asks if the captain did everything right. The prince claims that he was reproached for not just touching a woman's body. Hearing about this, the man in the white shirt says what kind of garbage this is. Melek, leaving the office, turns to the captain and says that he disappointed him. The prince says that everything was wrong and this is nonsense and let Blake fall down. However, the blonde guy asks the prince what happened. Croft replies that it's nothing special. He just had a quarrel with the princess. Blake, turning to the captain, say that the conflict with Duke Blanche will not play into their hands, and maybe he will apologize to the princess and not deepen the conflict. Croft, hearing about this, screams that she hit him. The blonde guy asks what he could have done to deserve this. The prince says that the teacher was just scared, however, he didn't do anything like that. And I thought that it was worth it. The blonde guy argues that women should be treated with kindness, especially when it comes to Princess Blanche. Ada, however, the prince had better behave differently with her than usual. Croft replies that he is trying. Black reports that Prince Pezalos is already on his way, and he asks not to talk to Duke Blanche about this until he goes to the palace. Prince Pezilos is the younger brother of the last emperor and Croft's uncle. He strives for the throne in the most unscrupulous way. After the death of the emperor, the crown prince, the first heir to the throne, died due to an unknown illness. After this, the nobles had to split, siding either with Prince Croft, Archduke of Pezalos. However, Croft would have had a hard time if there had not been a rumor that it was the Grand Duke who had abandoned the Crown Prince. To avoid the stigma of a murderer, he had to arrange a sincere confession, because all the witnesses know that he never abdicated the throne. Croft thought that he had never been to the palace before, so he needed to be careful. Blake suggests that the prince should first apologize to the princess and at the same time say that it was all due to cultural differences. Croft reports for the third time that it was he who was hit. The blonde guy says that if so, did he really get hurt? However, there is a bruise on the princess's arm, and suggests that he apologize anyway. 
Riviera, seeing the prince, greeted him, and she thought that she was becoming scared to look him in the eyes. Sitting at the table with the prince, the young lady thought that he looked embittered. And at this rate, it will definitely end. The girl thought that she shouldn't have hit him. Suddenly, Croft says to forgive him. Hearing this, the princess thought that he had just apologized. The young guy says that he is not yet accustomed to her rules and customs. However, he hopes that the girl can understand him. The surprised teacher heard this and thought why he was apologizing since it was she who hit him. Riviera says she doesn't understand what the prince is talking about. However, he has nothing to apologize for. Croft thought that it looked like the girl was not going to involve the duke in this, and he gladly offers to start the meal. The princess, watching his majesty eat, thinks that he is surprisingly neat, and there is not a single flaw in his table manners. The young lady thinks that if she had to complain, it would only be about the amount of food. The teacher thinks that whoever eats more will be healthier, and this is probably a remnant of his country. The young lady waited until the prince had eaten and asked if his highness was familiar with the art of dancing. Surprised, Croft replies that he has never danced before. Without thinking much, the prince says that the question is why he is very familiar with the dances and blades performed on the battlefield, and he has never danced differently before and therefore will make a lot of mistakes. Hearing this, the princess thinks with pleasure that this is very nice. However, she will find fault with everything she can so that the prince will leave her alone. The teacher suggests that we need to start as early as possible and maybe today. The young guy asks if she heard him. The princess, claiming that when the emperor ascends the throne, he will have to organize many balls and banquets. In addition, you will have to organize events for the meeting of foreigners. And if they find out that the emperor does not know how to dance, they will simply laugh at his majesty. After talking about it, where the girl thought that she needed to be persistent, the teacher says that as far as she knows, Croft will have no problems with dancing. After Croft becomes emperor, many women who want to rise in the social hierarchy will approach him. However, after Riviere becomes empress, nobles wishing to appease the emperor will continue to send their daughters to court. Because Lillian, the main character whom Croft will fall passionately in love with, will be among them. There was a wonderful scene in the novella in which Croft and Lillian dance under the moonlight. The young lady thought that he definitely needed to learn to dance. Since there was no other way out for the prince, he realized that he would have to dance. The teacher suggests meeting in the great ballroom at the first at three o'clock. His majesty says he doesn't really like dancing, and he understands that the princess is unlikely to give up so easily. The master realizes that he has no benefit from future confrontations with her, since this is only a deal that pits Duke Blanche against Prince Pazilos. Croft realizes that he is giving him this chance in exchange for a place for his daughter as empress. Perhaps until the post of emperor was so close the prince did not understand this, but his uncle was still a duke. How much outside help is needed in times like these? His majesty reasons that if he continues to avoid etiquette lessons, the duke might become suspicious. Croft realizes he only has one week left. As if dancing or even arranging flowers, he will do whatever it takes. Just to adapt to the rhythm of the princess. Melek saw the prince, the captain screams and asks for forgiveness for calling him trash because he understood everything wrong. The man in the white shirt suggests that the captain not worry as Princess Blanche will soon understand how he feels. The prince asks how he feels. Melek says Blake told him everything. He says that he heard that the captain loved the princess at first sight. The man in the white shirt says that this is not surprising since the captain was sent away because you shouldn't have tried to kiss her when they first met. Blake, justifying himself to the prince, says that he thought of everything a little. Croft orders the three of them to go to the training field. When Melek heard about this, he said that it was simply wonderful. The young lady asked Zeroni to find out where he was and what he was doing, because he told her that Croft was into fencing. The teacher thought that if he didn't want to come, why didn't he say so right away? She doesn't understand why he kept her waiting. While training, the guy suddenly remembered that he promised the princess to meet her in the large hall. Black asks the prince if he forgot about his promise, and maybe he will suddenly be beaten again. Melik tells Blake to look because it must be Princess Blanche. Blake claims that this is not the princess, and the man in the white shirt says that he must ask her personally. Seeing Melik, the young lady thought that he was very huge. The man turns to the lady and says his name, and says that he is the captain's subordinate. Melik claims that he is not a knight, just one of his warriors. The man asks if he can talk to the princess as usual. Croft saw a smiling girl and thought that she was very kind to him, and he came closer to her. 
The teacher asks what His Highness is doing here and who thought that he forgot about his promise and did not come, called him a freak. The prince thought that Riviera could arrange anything in front of his subordinates. And to avoid this, he decides to leave. Melek asks the captain why he is leaving so easily. Maybe he was embarrassed. The man in the white shirt thought that something was wrong with the captain. And maybe he said something wrong. The teacher thought that she could not see where the prince had gone. Suddenly, the girl heard Croft calling her. Coming closer to the girl, the prince thinks that since he has already messed up, he must accept any punishment, be it her fists or feet. Seeing the guy, the main character decides to leave. However, she is restrained by the prince's hand, which grabs her. At this time, the young man remembered that he should not touch a woman without permission and quickly took his hands back. However, the girl suddenly falls. Looking at her, the prince thought about why it was so easy to knock her down. At this time, the teacher thought about whether it was possible to treat other people this way. The prince felt guilty and offered the girl his hand to help her get up. The teacher kicks the guy and screams that she said that you can't touch a woman without permission. However, after some time, the young lady felt pain in her leg. Croft came closer to the girl and took her in his arms, and at this time, the princess asked him what he was doing. The captain suggests that she can hit him later if she wants, but for now, just don't move. Riviera asks why he can just let her go. The young man put the girl on a chair and took off her shoe. The teacher asks what he is doing and tells him to stop touching her immediately. The prince touched his toe and said, Fortunately, the bone did not seem to be broken, and it looks like a simple bruise and suggests that the girl apply something cold. Croft warns her to avoid such blows. However, if he wants to harm him, then it's better to scratch or bite him. Rivera says she thought he was just crazy, but he's also a pervert. The young man invites the girl to take her to the room and asks if she minds. A young guy takes the teacher in his arms and says that it's better for her not to go on her own for a while. Having arrived in the room with the girl, the prince tells the servant to pour very cold water into the basin. Croft takes off the young lady's shoe and at that time the maid saw this, who then screams that the prince cannot do this. The maid says that even if he were a future emperor a hundred times, he still cannot behave so impudently with their mistress. And no matter what the duke says, she is ready to give her life to protect their mistress. Hearing this, the prince was very surprised and thought that she, of course, said that one should not touch her carelessly, but he did not expect this. However, he took the girl's hands away and said that before using cold water, let her take off her socks. The lady, turning to Zorona, says that she has stubbed her toe and asks if she could bring her some cold water. The maid asks what happened, and the young lady thought that she couldn't tell her that she kicked the future emperor. Riviera replies that it just happened that way. Hearing this, the maid says that the rumors were not true and that he is a terrible person. Holding her feet in the cold water, the main character thought about how weak she was because she had dislocated her finger by slightly kicking the prince. The young lady says that Croft is not her only problem, but she must find a way to survive in this world. After some time, Croft entered the princess's room and offered to talk. The captain asks the girl if her leg is better. The main character replies that she is better, but in his highness she thinks that recovery will take some time, and teaching dancing will no longer be so easy. The gentleman replies that it is not so important for him to learn to dance. Riviera reports that teaching him etiquette is becoming problematic, and he should think about another person. Croft says he thinks they should talk about this already. He asks the princess if she really doesn't want to teach him etiquette. Hearing about this, the excited lady says that her father appointed her as the prince's teacher only so that they could begin a relationship. The young man claims that he knows everything about it. Hearing this, the main character was very surprised. Croft reports that he will gladly accept her as empress. And if she doesn't want to be his teacher, then let her just say so. The guy says that even if she doesn't do this, they will still get married. The prince says that if the girl is not sure of him, then they can hold an engagement ceremony before he ascends to the throne. In the book, Croft chose Riviere as his empress, but even after the wedding, their relationship remained cold, and Croft got rid of her immediately after meeting Lillian. Therefore, it seemed to her that he would be against this marriage. However, the prince has no reason to refuse the wedding, especially since he is unlikely to meet the love of his life so soon. Croft argues that in this situation, not teaching etiquette will not help him. The princess tells the guy that she can teach him any manners he wants, 
The young lady says that she does not want to, and the prince asks her that she does not want to marry him, and asks what is the reason. Riviera thinks that she does not want to die because of him, and at the same time cannot tell him. The prince thought that the young lady already liked someone. He suggests that she remain his etiquette teacher until he ascends the throne with the help of the duke and takes control of the imperial palace. Croft thinks that after this it will no longer matter to him who her father is and what he is capable of. The young lady thinks that he is pretending to treat her like an empress in order to ingratiate himself with Duke Blanche. When he becomes emperor, he will immediately eliminate the duke. The main character understands that this was the meaning of the words he said to her, and this is a good start to becoming a tyrant. The princess asks that after this he can send her wherever she wants. The man confirms her words. Hearing this, the young lady says that it is part of her to teach him etiquette. Croft says he doesn't really want it, but in the end he agrees. The prince says it's time to go eat, and he suggests that the girl should not strain her leg until the swelling goes down. The young man takes the girl in his arms to carry her to the dining room. The young lady, turning to him, says that before touching a woman and the prince continues the conversation, say that he knows that you need to ask permission. Riviera thinks it's that she needs to do something with her body so that she has the opportunity to escape in case of danger. The girl thought that she needed to be independent. Arriving in the hall, the prince saw the Duke of Blanche. The Duke asks how he likes his etiquette lessons with his daughter. Looking at them, he says that it looks like they have become close. The prince says that the lessons are going great, and he has already learned a lot. The Duke reports that although the girl is young, she is already capable of providing his highness with worthy assistance. The prince agrees with him and says that he has no doubt about it. The young man asks what news is from Prince Pezilos. The duke replies that he mentioned Prince Azen as expected. Prince Azen, the only surviving prince besides Croft, will die at his hands. It is because of this that he will be called a tyrant. As a result, Prince Pezilos, who led Azen to death, Lillian will bring her niece straight into Croft's arms. The main character is head over heels in love with his former enemy. However, if the main character had not killed so many people along the way, maybe he would have succeeded. Duke Pezalos will demand that His Highness confront Prince Azen. Having ascended the throne, the prince must deal with this situation as quickly as possible. However, it seems that the events from the original novel will be repeated in the future. Although they made a deal, if this crazy dog in the role of emperor breaks loose, then what will be the point of it? The girl asks. As a result, Duke Blanche will be destroyed. The main character thinks about what will happen to her. She decides that in order to prevent these events, she needs to stop Croft from falling in love with Lillian. The young lady reflects that she has a great backup plan which she brilliantly laid out. Looking at the guy, the main character thinks that his eyes are slightly ferocious and this is his charm. And every time she looks at him, he seems unapproachable. The main character of the story spent most of her time shouting, advising Lillian to run away from him. However, having become one of the secondary heroines of the story, the young lady understood why Lillian fell in love with Croft so much. Sometimes the idea that violent and serious men are an excellent choice and simply washes away common sense. The main character didn't read the book for that long, but since it's a romantic novel, everyone probably had a happy ending. And if everything is done correctly, there will be a good ending. The girl thinks that all this is the same as in the original, only she needs to make sure that Lillian doesn't get scared, and then Croft won't go crazy missing her when she runs away. However, if they immediately get together, how much bloodshed can be avoided? The main character thinks about whether she will be able to change the course of history. The young lady looks at the prince and thinks that she will help him change and let him leave it to her. Riviera is offered to his highness after a meal with a woman he likes, then she should be invited to tea or for a walk. The prince asks if this is etiquette. Hearing about this, the young lady thought what a nightmare it was and how he could even get away with Lillian. The young lady offers to explain as it is part of etiquette. The girl claims that if he is interested in someone, then it is best to invite her for a walk or arrange other leisure activities after eating. The young man agrees and answers that the lady's leg hurts so a walk won't work and offers to go for a ride together. Riviera objects because she can walk. The prince claims that if he overdoes it, his leg will continue to hurt. The main character asks whether his highness will continue to wear it. The prince replies that he doesn't care because it is not heavy. Croft thought that she was a strange woman and also damn stubborn. 
Because she doesn't like to accept help, however, this is also cultural. The main character reflects on even more misunderstandings from the future emperor. The prince really thought that everything would work out by itself. But in contrast to this, Riviere grabbed her hand and immediately let go as it crashed to the floor. And then she hurt her finger by kicking it. Croft thought that the girl had a very unusual body, and if she continued to walk around with a dislocation at this rate, she would develop a fracture. Without thinking for a long time, the young man took the young lady in his arms and said that he thought it would be better this way. At this time, the main character thinks that she asked the prince not to touch her without permission. At that time, the lady understood why Lillian was afraid of him. Riviera warns his majesty that he will headbutt him on the forehead. The prince says that her forehead might break and she should be careful. Croft says if she's angry and suggests that she'd better pull his hair. The teacher indicates that his highness repeats after her and tells him to speak correctly. The prince, repeating after the young lady, asks if she could excuse him. The girl reports that he is doing great, but only the prince must say it first. The young lady asks the guy to stop groping people. However, once her leg heals, he won't have to worry about that anymore. The teacher reports that there is a very small sprain, and it should heal in three days. The prince says that he thinks it will take about three months. Hearing about this, the young lady asks if he's mocking her. His highness replies that he's quite serious, because a sprain cannot heal in three days. The prince tells her not to be so sure of this because he judges from experience. Croft thinks it's time for him to have some fun. The young man says it's incredible that she's still alive with a body like that. The girl agrees with him and says that she is also surprised. His majesty reports that the girl has an upright posture and moves quickly. He says if she strengthens her body and learns a couple of tricks, then you will become much better. Croft says that in an attack, it is not so much the strength itself that is important, but the ability to distribute it correctly. It is necessary to hit the enemy's vulnerable points to cause significant damage. However, if you just attack like crazy, you will only harm yourself. The guy claims that the ability to distribute force comes from strengthening muscles. The surprised girl asks what an attack is. His majesty replies that, and since, for example, what she recently tried to do. However, it is not easy to catch a person off guard in such a position, how much she could have hurt her neck. The young man says, since her bones can be so easily damaged by a strong blow, he suggests using the palm of his hand, for example, slapping her in the face. The main character claims that a slap in the face is unlikely to hurt. The prince asks if hurting yourself is worse. The girl, turning to his highness, asks whether he simply shouldn't commit acts worthy of such punishment. Croft replies that he would gladly not do this, but she knows that he is just learning. However, her blows are not painful at all. The prince thinks that it is more like the flight and landing of a butterfly. The main character says that in order to match him, she will have to become much stronger. The prince asks if she wants him to teach her. The young lady does not understand the question, and Croft explains to her that while she teaches him etiquette, he will teach the girl the art of battle. Hearing about this, the main character says that this is not necessary, and the prince objects and says that they don't agree with her here. Riviera argues that the prince is offering to teach him how to be properly. The guy replies that you need to do good deeds. The young lady, claiming that she would rather do everything herself. Croft asks if it will be difficult for the princess to train alone. She thinks that he doesn't want to train and will just do the exercises. Although with such a body, even this will not be easy. And if she suddenly decides to run away, the duke will be furious. In the novel, the prince was described as the god of fencing, and the girl is not sure, but it seems to her that he is an expert in handling the ball. And even more so, this will remove suspicions that she is planning something with Croft. The princess says that she wishes him good luck in this. The prince replies that he also sincerely wishes the same for her. The prince, whom the girl considered a terrible tyrant, turned out to be not so bad. Following her lessons after breakfast, he understood how to invite to tea. After all, this is why education is so important. The young lady says that the main feature of tea is its deep aroma and suggests it is better to drink it more slowly while savoring it. Croft replies that it is too bitter and tasteless and asks how anyone can drink it. Hearing about this, the girl thinks that her maid specially brewed such tea. The main character orders Zeroni to bring tea leaves and dishes for him since black tea is used for tea drinking. The princess herself made tea for the master and invites him to try it. I enjoy the tea. The prince says that it is very tasty. The young lady says that she is very glad because he liked it. 
The prince thinks that he should also do something nice for the girl. His majesty asks the young lady if she would like to practice with the sword. The main character thought that it was impolite to take out a sword in the middle of a tea party. Croft says sword training is the best way to strengthen your upper body, and if she immediately starts waving it back and forth, she will most likely break her arm. He suggests that, hey, be careful. The girl objects that she won't break her arm swinging a simple sword. The prince says that the princess kept her hand and sword in a straight position and let him slowly raise and lower it. The guy suggests that she lightly touch the tip of the sword to the ground and then raise it to the sky. However, the young lady does not succeed because the sword is heavy and it is incomprehensible to her. Croft supports the girl and tells her to try again. He suggests that she start raising the sword from ground level. And the slower she does this, the better her muscles will develop. However, the young lady does not succeed, and the prince asks if she is using all her strength. He claims that if a girl tenses her stomach, it will become easier for her to use it. The main character says that she is doing everything she can. The tired princess asks what kind of sword this is and why it is so heavy. His majesty replies that the sword is a little heavier than ordinary blades. However, it is not so heavy that it cannot be lifted. However, the prince agrees with the girl and says that he will prepare a wooden sword for her. The gentleman reports that his colleague will arrive today, and don't let the princess worry about it, and a ticket for the girl to tell the maids not to approach the annex. The main character asks him if the prince wants to say that he has such a bad character that he can harm her people. His majesty replies that his character is not entirely bad, but she is quite capable of irritating the servants. The teacher says that she doesn't really like that a person who can cause discomfort to her servant will come to them, and then she remembered what the prince said about the woman. The gentleman says that this is not a man. Young lady say that this girl has no idea what kind of unpleasant things she can do. However, it suggests that after it only scorched earth will remain. The princess asks who this guest is. The gentleman replies that this woman is the Redbird Kinsel, and she is a famous magician of the East. The young lady remembers what the Redbird Kinsel is about in the part of the novel that she read. Blake, turning to the guy in the white shirt, says that it's all his fault and asks why he woke her up and invited her here, because the woman slept peacefully for a whole year. The magician Kinsel is a witch of the East, and the Black Catastrophe says that she is insane. Seeing the prince, she greets him and says that they have not seen each other for a long time. Croft tells her not to even think about creating problems here. The prince suggests first discussing whether she needs to be here at all. The magician asks when she ever created problems. However, Kinzel agrees that she would never want to spend the night in such an estate. The master tells her to follow him. His majesty leads the magician into Riviera's room and introduces them. Kinzel says, turning to the girl, that it is a great honor for her to meet her. The magician looks at the princess and says that Melik did not lie. Croft says that this is the same woman who will marry him and become empress. The witch, turning to the leader and saying that this is too much, since such beauty should be enjoyed together and he's going to appropriate it only for himself. The princess does not understand what the guest is talking about. Croft informs Kinsel that he has already made a decision to get married. The woman calms him down and says that she doesn't mind since she just came anyway. The main character does not understand what is happening, however. Their conversation looks like a chaotic exchange of phrases. The prince asks the woman if she will leave this place soon. The witch replies that no, because she likes it here. The guy claims that she said that she didn't want to stay here. His majesty thought that at least I would tire her easily and there shouldn't be any problems with her. The prince pushes the woman out of the office and seeing this, the main character asks where they are going, and she thinks that they have something to talk about. Croft sits down opposite the princess and claims that they have nothing to talk about, and he sees that the girl is ready for him to arrive. The main character hearing this says that she will decide depending on the situation. Hearing about this, the prince asks what exactly the situation is. The young lady replies that this is the situation when it turns out that his highness makes and breaks his own promise one day. Croft turns to the princess that this is just a misunderstanding, and the girl replies that she is giving him the opportunity to eliminate all the misunderstanding by explaining himself. The prince thinks about how to explain this to her, because being Kinsel's love interest is like being a walking sacrifice. However, this is not the best development. His Highness says it's hard to explain in detail, but it looks like Kinsel has fallen in love with her. The guy claims he was forced to say that he would marry her and heard about it. The witch would retreat. 
The prince says he was simply being proactive. However, suddenly the main character asks his highness if he likes her. The girl thought that after all the beatings, something appeared from him, and these may be secret feelings. The young lady thinks that she wants to give her place to Lillian and get out of there as quickly as possible. Riviera says that she hopes that his highness will keep his promise. Seeing the woman, the man in the white shirt screams, and she tells him that he is too noisy. Melik asks if she met the princess and if she is beautiful. Hearing this, the witch became very angry and angrily said that he had not yet learned to shut up when necessary. However, she can rip out his tongue. Hearing this, Melik screams that it is not necessary. Melik again asks if the princess is probably beautiful. Kinsel replies that she will wipe out this entire empire from the face of the earth if even one tear sheds from her eyes. Near the door to the palace, the witch is met by Blake, and the woman suggests that he get out of the way if he doesn't want to ruin her mood. The guy asks if she is going to sleep. The witch tells him to leave her alone, otherwise she will send him back to the east. Blake says that he doesn't think this magic circle will be able to send him to the eastern castle. The knight asks the woman if she really intends to stay here, and he invites her to take her to the Imperial Palace. Kinsel claims that she has no reason to go anywhere since there is a leader and a princess who will become empress. Hearing this, Blake asks if the princess said so. The woman says that the captain said about this that he would marry the princess and make her his empress. Hearing this, the knight happily says that they have finally made peace. The witch asks about the captain's mistreatment of the princess. The worried knight says that these are just rumors, and he says that the captain said it was his princess who hit him, and if he said so, then it's true. The woman says that he should have told him this from the very beginning, because he almost forced her to kill the captain. Kissel is informed that she needs to rest, and Blake asks how long she will sleep this time. The witch says that she was awakened and forced to use magic, and that is why she's tired. The woman offers to lock Melek somewhere far away for three days, otherwise she will kill him. When the witch closed the door, the knight thought that for now everything would be calm. The main character met with her friends. The ladies ask Princess Riviere who the man who will become emperor is. And is he as scary as rumors say? The lady with brown hair asks that people from the east are cruel, and his highness is the same. The main character, I thought that it was the archduke who decided to spread such rumors. She needs to deny everything while people are talking about it. Because she won't allow Croft's reputation to be tarnished, this is the only way she can survive. The princess claims that his highness is very calm and very careful while remaining strong. The main character says that the prince is simply unfamiliar with their etiquette, but however this is temporary, because he is extremely attentive and kind. The lady with brown hair says that it is a real pleasure for her to teach such a wonderful person. When the main character heard about this, she thought that this was exactly what should reach Lillian's ears. Riviera says they had a good time today and thanks their friends for coming. The lady happily says that they would be happy to continue coming to her. Suddenly, the prince appeared and the main character asks him if he is going to the training hall. The young lady thinks that everything will be fine since she has prepared everything for him. Looking at the girl, the prince thought that, judging by her look, if he did something wrong, he would be beaten again. Riviera looks at the prince excitedly and thinks that he should now demonstrate good manners. Croft approaches the princess and asks for forgiveness for his impudence and says that her leg has not yet healed and offered to carry it. Seeing this, the friends were very surprised, and so was the lady. Arriving in the room, the prince reports that he brought a wooden sword and placed it near the girl. The main character taking the sword says that not really, although now she thinks about it, that if she points the sword in his direction, she will commit high treason. And after that, he smiles and offers to pick it up. Riviera asks what significance this has during training, and why should she train if she is not going to fight? The girl asks what she can do with such a body. The prince claims that he wants to teach her to fight. The young lady thinks that after her leg heals, she will simply begin to exercise calmly. Suddenly, she saw the prince very close, and thought about why he was coming to her, and whether he wanted her to headbutt him or kiss him. However, the girl doesn't want either one or the other. Croft says the girl's dexterity is impressive, and he believes that she just needs to strengthen her strength and endurance. The main character grabs the prince by the hair, and he apologizes and asks her to calm down. The young lady speaks to his highness and asserts that not everything can be corrected with an apology. 
The prince reveals that he just wanted to test her reaction and did not intend to kiss her. Croft once again asks for forgiveness because he thought this would be a good reaction test. Riviera turns away from the prince and tells him that this is a bad thing. Croft asks about hair pulling not being considered cheating. The young lady says that considering how his highness treated her, however, the girl doesn't think so. The gentleman says that at first he thought that the princess was much tougher than she looks, but now he realizes that she has a sweet side. The guy claims that it will be difficult to train with an injured leg. Since Kinsel is here, let Riviera ask her for help. The main character says that since they now have a new guest, she would like to arrange a dinner for his subordinates. The gentleman asks if this is necessary. The young lady says that, since they will be dating in the future, she thinks getting to know each other over dinner would be a good idea. The gentleman claims that they will meet in three days, and then he will think about it, because Kinsel will sleep for three days. Croft says that a witch can sleep peacefully for three months. The surprised young lady says that in three days her leg will be completely healed. The prince says they have a lot of work to do until then. The princess's help in reading the complex documents sent by the Duke Blanche is especially pleasant, and she explains everything much better than what is written there. A beautiful voice, pleasant pronunciation, and a calm tone that calms the mind. Even stories about complex power conflicts are no longer so incomprehensible if Riviera tells them. The prince thinks that if she were a simple beauty, this would not be the case. His Majesty asks why the story of 300 years ago is so interesting. The young lady reports that the events of the future are only a reflection of the past, and there's nothing wrong with knowing a little history. The prince claims that the princess has naive conclusions, because history was written by liars who twisted everything according to their whims. The emperor in history books is always described as incredible, but his sordid personal life is never written about. Having overthrown the empress, he finished her off and sent their little son to the eastern border to certain death and in the books of emperors they are glorified as saints. The main character thought that if you look at it from this side, then she even feels sorry for Croft. The princess says that not everyone believes this lie and suggests they go eat. Sir Gillian, coming to Lady Riviere, screams and says that this is a challenge to their entire duchy, and he cannot allow the dishonorable death of his subordinate to pass just like that. The man says that he wants to challenge this crazy witch to a duel, and asks the lady to give him the right to do so. The princess says that she understands his feelings, but this girl is a subordinate of his highness. However, they shouldn't do anything rash, at least not until they find out what really happened. Sir Gillian heard this and says that it was a crazy woman who snuck into the bedroom and plunged him into eternal sleep because he couldn't even defend himself because he didn't have a weapon. The man claims that he knows absolutely everything there is to know. The young lady thought that the woman who had gone was Kinsel. This story happened three days after the witch settled here. At first it was quiet and the young lady does not know why the woman did this. The knight says that when they found out about what happened, Kinsel had already disappeared and only Hamilton's body remained. The princess, arguing that they should wait because she does not intend to just start a conflict with the emperor. However, if he does do something reckless, then he should be ready to remove the coat of arms of their family from his armor. The man claims that Hamilton was killed. The young lady says that she understands everything, but does not ask him to forget about it. The girl says that she is only asking to give her some time. Arriving at the prince, the main character asks him if he is going to finish off the guard commander. His highness replies that if he wants to fight his subordinate, then he doesn't mind. However, the prince claims that he can fight on behalf of Kiesel. Croft asks the princess if she thinks he will lose. The young lady replies that even if it were possible, her father himself would have strangled the commander. The princess asks if the witch has escaped. Croft says she's too crazy to run away for fear of punishment. His Highness and the princess came to Kinsel's room. The woman asks the princess what happened to her leg. The young lady replies that she simply dislocated her finger. Kinsel says that she hopes from now on they will become a little closer to each other. The princess stops holding on to the master and thanking him. The young lady turning to the witch asks why she killed Lord Hamilton. The woman replies that she did everything in her power. The princess asks if he was rude to her. Kinsel says that if he had done anything to her, he would still be walking on his own two feet. However, even though she is a princess, she will not be able to tell her all the truth, because one little bird did not want her to spill the beans. Croft says he doesn't think removing one of the local guards is bad for them. However, he would even say this to their advantage. 
The princess turns to the woman and says that she has the right to know why one of the defenders of her family was killed. The main character claims that if his death was unjust, then she will have to punish the criminal. Surprised, Kinsel asks the young lady if he was someone important to her and why she is so worried. The main character says that she did not know him personally, but he had served in her family for a long time. Kinsel says if the princess is responsible for such things, then in the future she will ask her permission to kill Duke Blanche. The woman reports that she will gladly accept a duel from that guard captain and asks if she can finish him off. The princess heard this and said no. Suddenly a maid knocks on the room and asks for forgiveness because someone wants to talk to them. Seeing the worried maid, the princess asks her if she has anything to say. Kinsel approaches the maid and says that she doesn't have to talk about this. The princess asks what her name is and the maid says her name is Barry. The main character tells Barry not to worry and to say whatever she wants. The maid reports that the sorceress was just trying to save her. The story she was told turned out to be ordinary. This is a rare case where a knight is killed for attempting to defile a servant. After listening to all this, the princess turns to Zeroni and says that now this girl is her maid and let her teach her everything she needs to know. The young lady orders to tell Sir Gillian to let him come into her office. When Gillian came to the office, the princess said that as soon as he takes out the blade, he will be immediately excluded from the order of the knights of the Duchy of Blanche. The man screams that this witch killed the lord. The princess says that Hamilton will also be posthumously stripped of his knighthood of Blanche. Hearing this, the man cries out that a dishonorable death is not enough for the lord, or he will also be posthumously deprived of his title. He claims this is unacceptable. Riviera warns the Sir that if he continues to defend the man who desecrated the name of the Duke of Blanche, then measures will also be taken against him. The surprised man asks what the Lord did. However, this is not a mortal sin. Hearing this, the princess replies that it is none of her business and the man is furious and says that it is also none of this witch's business. Sir Hamilton reveals that he is the leader, and he is obliged to avenge the unjust death of the Lord. The man turns to the witch and challenges her to a duel. The sorceress agrees and accepts his challenge. However, the prince intervenes in a whirlwind and says that he will fight instead of her. Croft claims that Kinsel has already killed one of the duke's knights, and now he will also finish off the commander. However, when Blanche's duchy needs protection, he cannot afford to finish it off. The sorceress asks why he will fight because she was the one who received the challenge. The gentleman answers that in the future she will return this favor, but for now he will do this. The princess thought that it was impossible to spread the rumor that he had been challenged to a duel by a subordinate of the family that supported him. The young lady is informed that in such a case, the commander of the guard has the same right to a replacement. The main character, turning to his highness, says that being Duchess Blanche, she will fight with him in this duel. Everyone who heard this was very surprised. The surprised duke asks why her. The princess answers since the order of knights is under the jurisdiction of the duchy, so she is in charge and asks the question whether she is right. The young lady says that in any case, let him make sure that in the future the knights will not talk about this, because the duel will take place tomorrow and Sir Gillian may be free. The man objects, but the princess tells him to stop and leave. The prince tells the sorceress to get out of here too and let her return to the annex and sit there quietly. Hearing about this, Kinsel agrees and says that they will see each other tomorrow. Left alone, the princess asks his highness if he is going to finish her off. Hearing this, the young guy asks if she is joking. The young lady replies that she is serious and does not have the heart to joke with her life. The prince calms her down and says that he does not intend to do this. Rivera claims that she also has no intention of finishing him off, and that means everything is fine. Before the duel, Blake informs the captain that under no circumstances should he dress the princess, and the gentleman replies that he knows about it. The knight invites him to simply swing his sword a couple of times and end the duel. The prince says if he tries to knock the sword out of her hands, who might even break her hand. The gentleman offers to bring wooden swords. Seeing these swords, the young lady says that she definitely won't fight with a piece of wood, and the prince asks if she is going to fight with her bare hands. His Majesty asks the girl if she is going to use a real sword. The princess answers because this is a duel, and the prince asks to move the rapier, whichever is lighter. In this duel, the winner takes. All rights to truth and honor and the loser is obliged to fulfill the demands of the loser. After these words, the king offers to begin and raise his sword to the princess.
The young lady raising her sword says that she did it. However, the girl can no longer raise the sword because the prince is pressing on it. The gentleman says that according to the rules of a duel, this is how it should be done. The princess began to wave her sword, and suddenly the prince's sword flew away for some reason. Riviera herself doesn't understand how, but she injured the prince. His majesty says that he has lost, and asks that the good-natured princess not take his life. And at the same time he asks what she is waiting for, and let her announce that the duel is over. Sir Gillian asks what kind of duel this is. However, he says that the duel is officially declared over. Kinsel, coming closer to the girl, asks if the princess is okay. The concerned young lady says she hurt him. The sorceress smiles and says that this is good. The surprised princess asks what's good about this. The woman says that such a wound only needs to be treated and wrapped, and nothing else can be done. The main character thought that if something goes wrong, she could die without even getting to the palace. The worried princess turns to his majesty and asks if he is okay. The gentleman replies that they told her that she just needs to wrap up early. Riviera takes the prince by the hand and invites him to go for treatment. The sorceress says that the princess is much more determined than she seems. Blake agrees with the woman and says that it was not for nothing that she stole the captain's heart. However, it is funny because it is a very unexpected development of events. The main character is thinking about what she should do if simple treatment of the wound does not help and whether stitches are needed. The girl thinks about what will happen if the wound gets worse, if he dies from infection or something else. However, she will be killed at the same time for treason. The prince, turning to the girl, says that she is taking off his clothes right now. Hearing about this, the princess says that she did not mean to do this and apologized. Seeing the wound, the young lady says that he needs treatment because he is bleeding. The prince talks about taking off his clothes himself. Having seen the entire wound, the girl says that this bruise is serious. The prince says that she speaks as if she is upset about this. Riviera asks if this is possible. The gentleman replies that it would seem so to anyone. The main character says that she wouldn't worry if she knew that he had such a strong body. The prince survived countless attacks and against all odds became emperor. To survive such wounds was only because he really wanted to live. His majesty, addressing the girl, says that she is now groping him. The worried girl did not even notice this and asked for forgiveness for her action. The gentleman says that he will be generous and forgive her, because he now understands why she said to ask permission before touching her. Having changed his shirt, the prince leaned towards the girl and kissed her. After the kiss, the surprised lady asks what it was. The gentleman replies that he simply felt that he had to do it, because this is not a mistake, and she started it first. The princess says that it was his highness who started it, however, in general it was rude. Croft agrees with the girl and asks her to listen to him. The gentleman says that she is the first person who looked at his scars like that, and so he kissed her. The young lady thought about punching him. The main character thought that everything would be fine if she didn't have that look. However, she does not feel anything special for Croft, because she just felt sorry for him and that's all. Rivera suggests that it's time for him to think about problems about his personal life. The prince replies that his personal life has been a complete problem from the very beginning, and let her remember that even his father wanted to kill him. The princess, screaming, says that's not what she's talking about. Surprised, Croft asks the girl if kissing is prohibited in society. The young lady replies that that's not the point because he shouldn't kiss anyone without permission. His Majesty says whether she wants to tell him that there will be no problems if she gives him her permission to kiss. Prince says his skills have improved, but he is the type of person who learns by doing. Hearing this, the young lady replies that she thinks she should have punched him in the face. Croft replies that if she did that, she would break a couple of fingers on her hand. The main character says that with such actions, he will never be able to win a woman's heart, and they would rather hate him and try to run away. His Majesty looked at the young lady and realized that he was doing wrong and therefore asks the girl for forgiveness. Riviera calms the prince and says that everything is fine and invites him not to do this again. Croft asks the princess what she is asking for as the winner. The prince explains that she won the duel and was generous in sparing his life, and now she has the right to demand anything from him. The surprised girl asks the prince if he accepts defeat. His majesty replies that it doesn't matter what she thinks about it, since she won and let her say what she wants. The main character says that she wants to be expelled from the imperial palace in the future. 
She asks if he can draw up an agreement certified by a magician. Surprised, Croft says that she doesn't trust him. The young lady says they are not that close. However, the prince turns to the lady and says that he trusts her. Riviera explains to the prince that she is quite careful. His majesty reports that he will find a magician who can certify their agreement. Riviera thought that he was difficult to understand, because the prince is so ruthless that he is capable of any action. However, if you look at it this way, everything begins to make sense. The main character reflects on what is the only thing. What can be said about the prince is that he has a beautiful face and an excellent body. However, she does not understand what the essence of this beauty is if he never has it, and she doesn't want to watch him kiss others later. Suddenly, a maid knocked on the master's office, and then, opening the door, she screamed and said that His Highness did not notice that the young lady was in huge trouble, and he pretended not to notice it. The surprised prince asks what the trouble is. The maid responds that the duke scolds the princess for the duel, and he has been scolding the lady for an hour now because he wants to kick her out of his home. Hearing this, the prince quickly went out to save his lady. However, he stopped in front of the door and heard screams. Mr. Blanche claims that he asked the princess to take care of his highness, and she arranged a duel. He says that she doesn't even know how much effort he puts in for her. Croft heard about this, opened the door, and greeted the duke, and together with history, Vera will become her empress, and so there is no need to punish her so cruelly. The duke makes excuses and says that he did not try to scold the princess because he simply expressed some of his thoughts. He turns to the girl and invites her to rest, because tomorrow she will need to prepare a lot. The young lady leaves and turns to his highness, saying that she needs to talk to him about Count Tesla. Croft argues that today this boredom will end because a week has already passed since he arrived in the capital to ascend to the throne. However, only a week remains before the coronation ceremony. His Highness thinks that he will soon return to where he was expelled 17 years ago. The Imperial Palace of the Leuven's Empire turned out to be much larger and more majestic than she had imagined when she read the novel. It took the whole morning to explore this huge and luxurious palace. However, Despite the fact that he returned here 17 years later, Croft behaves as confidently as if he had lived here all his life, and he exudes the aura of the owner of this place. However, the princess noticed that all the evil glances were directed at the owner, because there is a faint sense of fear and contempt in their eyes, and also a very unintentional attitude. Because the prince has not yet done anything that deserves hatred, the main character is concerned about the question of why they treat the emperor this way, and if the emperor is treated this way by his servants, then there is no need to imagine the reaction of other nobles. The young lady thought that Croft was not so bad as to treat him like that. Seeing the lady's plans, his majesty asks the princess if she liked the food. The girl replies that everything is very tasty. The prince suggests that she eat a little more. Following noble etiquette, it is not customary to offer your food to others. The young lady thought about how she had not said anything against it. The main character asks the servant how he can laugh at the emperor in such a situation, and judging by his laughter, it seems like something funny happened. The worried servant replies that he did not laugh. The young lady asks what happened so funny, and suggests that he tell him and they will laugh together. The servant says it's not that important. The princess says if he can't stand still then she doesn't think he belongs here. Croft orders this man to be kicked out of the palace. Hearing this, the servant turns to his highness and says that he has made a mistake and asks for forgiveness. The prince turns to the young lady and says, since he is no longer here, she can relax. The main character reflects that on her first day in the palace, she kicked out a servant for disrespecting Croft. However, she cannot believe that she did it. Lying in bed, Riviera reflects on the fact that she planned to remain silent and quickly seal the agreement with Croft with the help of a magician, give her place to Lillian, and go off into the sunset. The princess cannot fall asleep for a long time because she thinks that everything has gone wrong. Croft also cannot sleep and thinks that, as expected, the current palace is a huge trap. Because he has Blake, Melek, Chest, and Kinsel with him, and yet significantly outnumbers them. Going to the throne of his majesty, servants and nobles bow, but still the emperor thinks that guards and potential enemies are hidden everywhere. The prince is sure that Duke Pezalos has already infiltrated his people everywhere. 
His Majesty is also aware of the disrespectful attitude of the servants since everyone here looks at him as an intruder, and he cannot help but notice it. Croft thinks that this is exactly what he expected, but he still feels unpleasant, and remembering a day from his childhood, he thinks that nothing has changed in so many years. And while the prince was thinking about a solution to the problem, Riviera herself offered it to him. They just need to get rid of their enemies and keep people capable of being his allies as close as possible. The next day, Riviera sees the emperor and asks if he slept well. His majesty understands that the lady is a necessary ally, and he looked at the girl and felt that he was missing something and it could be her thin lips. The excited prince thinks that it doesn't matter if she kicks him or rips his head off, but he thinks that she will be very angry. Looking at the charming main character, the guy smiled and thought that he didn't want to anger her. Riviera thought that this was the first time she had seen him smile, and it was probably because he was at home. However, she is sorry because he has no one to share this joy with. Croft asks the princess if she liked today's food. The girl replies that it was delicious and thought that it was good that they changed the chef. The prince said that he would like to take a walk to the banquet hall and asks if she will join him. The Hainer Hall is the great banquet hall of the Imperial Palace. It is there that Croft's coronation will be celebrated in six days' time. However, there the prince will meet Lillian, the main character of the original novella. The hall, of course, was described as a magnificent place, and after looking at it, the girl realized that this was not too much. However, the original story will begin in a few days. Hey, the main character hasn't even lived a month in this book. The young lady thinks that she is still unfamiliar here. But if she doesn't want to die, then she shouldn't behave strangely. Croft behaved badly towards Lillian on the day of the coronation. However, it was love at first sight. In this story, the male protagonist is an incomprehensible and cruel tyrant. And at the same time, Lillian is an extremely inaccessible and secretive lady. Riviera understands why Lillian did not immediately open up to Croft, given their first meeting. She could simply be scared of the prince. The main character is thinking about how to bring them together without the difficulties she experienced in the book. She needs to work hard on Croft. Looking at the princess, his majesty asks if she wants to say something, then go ahead. The lady replies that she doesn't want to say anything. Suddenly, the main character saw a black veil and asked if this was the veil that was used at the funeral of the previous emperor. The maid replies that it was prepared especially for the coronation ceremony. The princess asks whose idea it was. The maid replies that Princess Belinda did it. The main character asks whether she means Countess Travitt and why she chose the decorations for the ceremony. The maid replies that no one else has the right to resolve such issues except her. The emperor and crown prince died. For a whole month, the empire was without an elected emperor. Before Croft was chosen all this time, someone had to run the life of the palace. However, this person was Belinda, the younger sister of the Duke of Pezilos. Pezilos pretends that he does not care about the throne, but in reality he is secretly gaining power and influence to conquer it. He even sent his younger sister, who had become a nun 20 years ago, to seize the palace because this black cloth is a congratulation to the nephew who returned after 17 years. The main character orders to immediately remove this thing, because she herself will choose new decorations and orders that the manager be brought to her. Croft looked at the servants and reported that they did what the princess said. The prince says, to be honest, he doesn't care about the decorations. The young lady hearing this objects because they are preparing for a wonderful event, not someone's death, and asks how he cannot care. The prince replies that it does not matter whether it is white or black, since it will not change the fact that he is the emperor. However, considering that Croft has been fighting for his life for a long time, he really might not care. The characters in the book can take care of themselves, and the girl just needs to save her life. The main character reflects that she now knows Croft personally. Because he may be weird, but he's clearly not the crazy bastard he's described as in the novel and the girl just doesn't want to be treated so unfairly. The princess claims that she cares, and the surprised prince asks why. The young lady replies that they are trying to show that he is not welcome here. Having heard about this, the main character does not understand. His majesty is very angry or laughs at her words. The prince, turning to Riviere, says that she can be his as much as she wants, but he will still kiss her. After the kiss, the surprised girl pushes the prince away from you and says that this is impossible. The gentleman asks if she is okay, and the young lady answers that his chin is made of steel. 
The main character asks why he suddenly decided to kiss her. The prince thought for a moment and replied that she said that she felt sorry for him. The gentleman says that the girl feels sympathy for him. Hearing this, Rivera insists that he should not dare to say that she is the first person who feels sympathy for him. The princess suggests going somewhere else first, because she would like to drink something refreshing. His Majesty says there is a small garden outside. Croft looks at the girl with pleasure and asks if her leg hurts since he can carry her. The princess assures him that there is no need to do this. Sitting in a beautiful garden, the prince looks at the girl and thinks about why he wanted to kiss her. However, he still feels this desire. His Majesty thinks that it may be curiosity or impulse. However, this impulse disappears as soon as someone shows reluctance. The gentleman is thinking about why this woman is so different from the others. In the East, people exploit others without any pity. The prince recalls that when he was exiled there, he was focused only on survival. Trying to survive, Croft made enemies and acquired comrades who could cover his back. Vindic's mercenaries have all joined forces to take revenge. Although they supported each other, these people still united to achieve their own goals and needs. Because even though these four have a special relationship, they do not feel any sympathy for each other. Mutual camaraderie is far from sympathy. However, how rare and valuable sympathy is, this cheap feeling that people so easily talk about is known to all residents of the East. Willingness to give a friend a helping hand to another, even if it does not bring him any benefit. The prince looks at the young lady and says that he first got it thanks to her, because she deserves to be special. However, according to Riviere, the kiss belongs to a slightly different category. And even frowning, the young lady remains a real beauty. Croft thinks that the problem is in these lips because they give rise to bad intentions during the day. The princess informs his highness that if she had to kiss all those for whom she feels pity, then by this logic she would kiss a street cat, because the same applies to poor starving children and wounded soldiers. Hearing this, the prince says that he understands and invites her to stop because he doesn't even want to imagine it. The lady asks what lesson he learned from this. Croft replies that she has a big heart that can sympathize with anyone and that she does not want to kiss him. The main character heard this and said that it's good that he understood everything. The prince claims that sympathy may not be so important for her, but for him it is a special thing. However, the gentleman still wants to kiss her, so let the lady tell him what to do for this. The main character informs the gentleman that such words sound quite offensive, because kissing should happen between people who truly love each other. Croft says that this cannot happen, and the place for her to talk about love offers to come up with a way. Riviera heard this and thinks that this is the man who slaughtered the people of the Empire because of love. Young lady, turning to his highness, ask if he believes that love does not exist, because he simply does not need to meet a person whom he will love and make her his empress. The prince reveals that there is no such thing as love and it is just an illusion, misunderstanding, or deception. Hearing this, the young lady thinks that he is too confident, even though he has not yet met the main character. The lady insists that no matter what he says, she still believes in love. And she doesn't want to kiss someone she doesn't feel the same way about. And he suggests not to talk like that anymore. Croft says because she doesn't want to, he won't do anything. And in this case, she will continue to feel sympathy for him. The girl claims that she will until someone appears who will feel sorry for him more than she does. The prince overheard says that this suits him and invites the girl to rest. The gentleman remembers that in childhood, a woman said that he should not hate the emperor, because he did so because he loved his mother very much. However, when he is already an adult, he understands that this is bullshit. Seeing Riviera, the maid asks what happened to her forehead again, as it is swollen and red. Zeroni was an additional character who wasn't even mentioned in the original. She probably died at the same time as Riviere Blanche. The young lady reflects that she wasn't interested in her before, so she didn't even think about it. The maid suggests taking a good look at her forehead and asking if it hurts. Lady, you understand that now she sees and talks to her every day. However, Zeroni is not just one of the additional characters. Anna is a valuable person who followed her even to the palace. Riviera asks the maid if she will change seats for a while. Zeroni sits down and thinks that the mistress usually doesn't do this and maybe she's angry. The young lady reports that her forehead must have turned red because she hit his highness's chin. And when his highness first came to the duchy, 
Her hand turned red from hitting the prince in the face. However, when she kicked him in the leg, she dislocated her toe. The maid, hearing all this, was very surprised, and the princess asked her if she was very worried. Zeroni replies that of course she was worried, but what was more important was that she hit him for his bad behavior. Riviera claims that the maid knows her very well. She wants to assure her that there is no reason to worry. The lady reports that she is looking for a compromise. The maid says that since she already knows everything, she won't worry about her too much. Sitting at the meal, the lady turns to his highness and informs him that he should learn to dance. The prince replies that he does not want to. Riviera thought that he would have to dance with the main character, since dancing is required. She claims that the prince asked her to teach him etiquette, because dancing is a basic skill among noble gentlemen. Croft thinks that the teacher continues to bother him with his lessons. After all, in the imperial palace, there is no end to the work, and he still needs to grab the lady and spin around. The prince thought that he could cover the Riviera and be closer to her, inviting her to start studying in two hours. The main character suggests calling the musicians. The guy heard about this and thought that because of them he would not be able to touch her lips. Arriving in the hall, the prince asks if he is late. The young lady replies that he arrived just in time and the musicians began to play. The main character informs his highness that when he asks a lady to dance, who should bow his head and ask her permission. However, there are no specific invitation phrases. Croft does everything as the teacher showed him and asks her if she would refuse him the honor of dancing with him. The mistress agrees to dance with him and says that he knows perfectly well what to do, even without her instructions. Croft kisses the lady's hand and then bites it. The surprised girl slaps the prince in the face and insists that you should not bite people. The lady is agitated and asks why he did this and was not satisfied at dinner. Riviera thinks that she was joking and does not understand why there is no answer. She doesn't understand whether there was such a situation in the novel, but in any case, it's a love story. And everything about him should be wrong. The prince, at the moment when he touched her lips, it seemed to him that they exuded a sweet aroma, soft and smooth fingers a little colder than lips, the aroma that turned his head, and the prince had a strange desire to swallow it. He ended up biting into that tender flesh. Croft says that he won't eat her and asks who she takes him for. Riviera suggests continuing to study dancing. She gives him her right hand and tells him to hold it, and with his left he can clasp her waist. His highness thought that the princess's waist was so thin that she didn't even know what to hold on to. The lady suggests taking the simplest steps, right and back, left and forward. The princess asks if it's difficult for him and suggests not to worry. Even if he steps on her foot, the girl will still forgive her. The gentleman thinks that if he steps on this little foot, it will break without a doubt. He claims that he will be careful and not step on anyone's foot. The lady says that she will only be glad if the prince tries and offers to try again. While dancing, the prince smells her scent and thinks that he is hugging a bouquet of flowers. The lady reports that the first song is over and his highness is learning quickly. The teacher says that after the end of the music you can bow and shows how. Croft suggests taking a little break, and the teacher agrees with him. The gentleman thinks that the first thing he did after arriving at the palace was dance. His majesty, seeing his friends from the east, asks what they are doing here. The guys claim that the captain dances very well, and maybe it's because he has a special teacher. The prince says that they have little work to do, and that is why they are idle. Blake reports that they came to make a report and were waiting for the captain because they did not want to interfere. The blonde guy reports that Kaisel has found out everything and asks if he should tell her to catch him and bring him. Croft says don't touch it yet because first you need to find evidence. The teacher, seeing the captain and his friends, asks if they have any important things to do and if they will finish today. The guy says they will continue. The lady claims that he has things to do, so that's enough for today. The prince offers to conduct Riviere. Walking down the corridor, the princess says that his subordinates follow him unconditionally. The gentleman says that this is not at all true. The teacher says that it seemed to her that they were very close and that Melik especially liked him. The prince says that all the mercenaries who call him captain have gathered together for revenge. The princess understands that these people have their own reasons. The gentleman says that Melik joined the mercenaries to avenge his father. His Highness reports that he killed Melik's father. The guy, in order to become stronger than him and take revenge, he joined his squad.
The young lady asks why he has a man under his command who is going to kill him. However, as a close person whom he encounters face to face every day, the princess does not understand what kind of life you need to live to have such a relationship. Arriving at Riviere's room, the gentleman invites the girl to have a good rest. The young lady thinks that since he is a tyrant, life in danger has become commonplace for him. However, she never even thought about the reason for his tyranny. The princess only wants to receive reassurance from the magician and raise Croft as best she can. She wishes to replenish her strength and leave the imperial palace safely. The days fly by so quickly. Although the prince does not have a wonderful character, the young lady wants to continue to take care of him. The next day, Rivera looked at herself in the mirror and saw a bruise, and she thought that Croft's body was made of steel. However, she needs to ask Zeroni to apply ointment to her. The maid, having smeared her forehead with ointment, asks if it hurts. The lady replies that everything is fine and asks if it can be hidden. Zeroni argues that cosmetics will not be enough. The head maid comes into the lady's room and reports that Princess Belinda has arrived to see the lady. Riviera says that she is not feeling well today and therefore cannot receive guests. She asks the guests to tell them that the princess will invite her later. The maid claims that Princess Belinda is the younger sister of the late emperor. She is a member of the imperial family and by law they cannot send her away. Riviera says that simply coming and asking for a meeting is a violation of etiquette because she tries to turn a blind eye to the princess's rude behavior and at this time the maid teaches her the rules of etiquette. The chief maid argues that imperial law is superior to aristocratic etiquette. Hearing this, Rivera wonders if she means that a young lady should not spoil her relationship with a person whom she will have to treat as an aunt in the future. However, in reality, the young lady does not intend to remain an empress. Riviera claims that she is staying here only as a guest invited by his highness, and the princess has no reason to insist on meeting her. The main character claims that the maid has no right to teach her, the maid informs that the young lady does not speak, does not speak. Princess Belinda is the only aunt of his highness. If she becomes her enemy, then it will not be more difficult for his highness to ascend the throne. Hearing about this, Riviera thought that she didn't want to create an extra headache for herself and agreed to go. Arriving at the countess's room, the young lady asks for forgiveness for keeping her waiting. Seeing the girl, the woman smiles and says that she is glad to meet you. However, Despite her rudeness, the countess came here to tell the princess something. Rivera asks if Madame is okay, and she says that she heard that the countess has an urgent matter and offers to talk about it. Countess Travitt introduces the princess to Emily and says that she is the daughter of a family with whom she has a good relationship. A woman introduces the girl, Lillian of the Vicontri, to the princess Ilmenda. The countess reports that they came together to meet the princess. She claims that these elegant data are ideal for the role of her assistants. The aunt says that she heard that Riviere came to the palace without a maid of honor. However, as a senior member of the imperial family, she could not ignore this fact. And so she brought these ladies to become her maids of honor. The princess reflects on the fact that she did not ask, however. The countess invited candidates for maid of honor from among her friends. Because among the emperor's concubines there were many ladies-in-waiting serving the empress. This must be what Belinda is aiming for. Riviera thinks they could just refuse, but Lillian is here, and if the prince meets her earlier, the sooner he will fall in love. Because in this situation, the young lady understands that she should be happy that everything is going well. However, she develops a feeling of resistance. The main character reports that she already has an assistant, the Duchess claims that the maid of an aristocratic family and the maid of honor of the imperial palace are radically different. However, she also needs a wise maid of honor. And Emily is better than anyone else in the imperial palace because the Countess taught her personally. And the same goes for the Archduke's niece, Lillian. Riviera claims that she will be staying here for a short time at the invitation of His Highness, and therefore she does not need much help. The woman says even if she returns to the duchy, these ladies would do well to write here. The countess asks the princess not to refuse her favor. The young lady thinks that it is difficult to refuse and in this case offers to accept the help of one of them because she is not sure if it is possible to invite two guests without his highness's permission. Riviera turns to Lillian Ilmenda and asks if she can help her from now on. The countess claims that this girl will be a good assistant for the princess. 
The main character looking at the girl says that she is glad to meet them. Rivera reflects that in many ways the peace of this world and her life is in Lillian's hands. Left alone in the room, the young lady reassures herself that everything will be fine. She thinks about how to arrange everything so that everything will work out well for Croft and Lillian. The maid reports that the prince has come to the lady. Entering the room, his highness asks the girl if she is angry with him. She thought that he was a tyrant who was always angry. The prince says that he thought something had happened because the girl did not come to breakfast. The young lady answers that she usually skips her morning meal. However, the gentleman thought that they would eat together. Riviera asks if he doesn't like to eat alone, and the prince replies that he is tired of eating alone. The main character thought that there were more than 50 people in the guild, and not a single one would share a meal with him. The young lady says she's not angry or sick, and it's just a bruise that appeared on her forehead. Seeing this, Croft apologized. The lady says that she was afraid that he would say exactly that, and therefore avoided him. Because it is her fault, and the prince has nothing to apologize for. Croft says that if someone saw it, they would think it was his fault. Rivera claims that it makes no difference since she knows that it is not Mr. Wine. His Majesty suggests starting the training they have been putting off for so long. He says that if she is going to be him, then let her use her fists and feet, not her forehead. Riviera reports that she warned not to do something for which you can be grabbed. The prince says he will try. And since the problem is solved, he offers to go eat. The young lady thought that in order for the prince not to eat alone, he needed to find him a friend, and it would be best to introduce Lillian to him. However, the first impression is important. The princess says that the countess came recently, and she introduced her to a girl who could become a maid of honor. The gentleman replies that he heard about it. Croft thought that the old fox decided to add a rat to them, and the reason why she wants to introduce the spy to Riviere is obvious. The main character reports that this girl is beautiful and kind, and it looks like her soul is bright. The lady thinks that if the prince meets her, he will definitely like her. Hearing this, the gentleman replies that this is still unknown. The lady suggests a private meeting. Riviera understands that His Majesty is dissatisfied now, but when he meets Lillian, everything will be different. However, she is the fatal partner with whom he is destined to be in the original story, if he does not meet earlier than expected, then peace in the Empire will come faster. Suddenly, Melek enters the room and reports that Kinsel is wounded. Hearing this, the princess asks Croft how she could have been injured. The sorceress does not say who injured her, but it seems that the knights know who did it. There are not many people on the entire continent capable of injuring Kinsel, and therefore only one magician comes to mind, Marmot, who one day must die at her hands. Blake asks the captain what's wrong with the sorceress and how long he can't find her because she disappeared. The knight reports that it is obvious that Kinsel went to this scoundrel. The captain asks Blake where all the guild members are now. The knight replies that they said they would reach the Imperial Palace today and must be waiting in the building. The duke orders him to take the guys with him as he will soon follow them too. Blake asks the captain what about his coronation ceremony. Croft claims that if the sorceress went after the guy, then their priority is to help her get revenge. Suddenly, the maid informs the master and the knights that Kinsel is in Riviere's room at this time. Hearing about this, his majesty quickly ran towards them. Entering Riviere's room, the prince asks what they are doing here. The sorceress replies that she consoled her heartache with the beauty of the princess. Croft says that if Kinsel goes somewhere, he should warn him. The young lady asks his highness why he behaves so well-fed who suffered. However, now the sorceress needs treatment. The surprised prince asks Kinsel if she is so ill that she cannot use healing magic. The magician answers if the captain is talking about the shoulder, then she has already healed everything. The prince tells her to get lost. Hearing this, the sorceress says that her mental wound has not yet passed. However, Chester takes Kinsel on his shoulders and carries him out of the room. The sorceress screams and says if he doesn't want to regret it, then let him let her go. And if the knight does not do this, then she will finish him off. Riviera asks if Kinsel is okay since there was a lot of blood. Croft replies that if we are talking about a wound on the body, then everything is in order. He thought that if something else was damaged, then it was a cause for concern. The prince asks the young lady if she likes Kinsel. The girl replies that she is worried about her. At this time, His Highness says that there is no need to worry since she has healing skills.
The main character says that just because the wound has healed does not mean that the pain has gone away. Croft asks if she and the sorceress have such a close relationship. Riviera replies that there is no difference. However, she cannot help but worry about the man who was injured and came to her for help. Croft thinks that the lady is worried about the people who came running to her with injuries, and he claims that everything is clear to him. The young lady does not understand what the prince is thinking about and what he is trying to convince himself of. Kinsel, turning to Chester, says that today she will spare him, and thanks to the princess she is in a good mood. Chester invites the sorceress to make a magic circle of movement to the location of this scoundrel, and he will finish him off. Kinsel asks if he thinks that the magician Marmot is still there. However, if Chester goes alone, the magician will definitely finish him off. The sorceress claims not to talk nonsense, and suggests that it is better to bring food for her since she is hungry. The magician Marmot is the son of her mentor's childhood friend and family member, However, the one who cast a spell on the body of the sorceress that would never allow him to be betrayed. From this day on, when Kinsel was betrayed and almost killed by the man she trusted, there is only one reason for her to live. The sorceress claims that she must take revenge on the magician Marmot. Arriving at Kinsel's room, the captain and his knights claim that it is impossible not to say that she does not know. The sorceress replies, turning to the captain that he is selfish because you want to enjoy Princess Riviere alone. Croft asks her if Kinsel was going to do something to the princess. The sorceress replies that she only asked the young lady to pat her head. The prince, turning to the sorceress, tells her to make a report. Kinsel claims that she couldn't get the evidence, and it seems these guys knew what she was looking for. The sorceress went north to find information about Viscount Sheldon, who was involved in the death of her mother Letitia, Empress Letitia was dethroned after being accused of treason with Viscount Sheldon. As a result, the Viscount and all those close to her mother died. The Viscountcy of Sheldon and the county were divided between three neighboring families. Oddly enough, the people who reported Letitia's betrayal were precisely the heads of those families. Because in order to overthrow everyone's beloved Empress, one of two things is needed, either strong evidence or a strong ally. However, at that time... They had no evidence, and Viscount Sheldon denied his relationship with the Empress, despite cruel torture. Croft reflects that without evidence, uncovering the truth was difficult and took time. It all ended when Guilford's faith and affection for the Empress gradually faded. There is no need for additional evidence if there is no faith of the Emperor. This is how his mother died and Croft was exiled. The Prince thinks that if there is no proof, then an ally is needed. The conspirators who were able to slander his mother received a decent reward for this. Croft was investigating three families who could receive compensation for a conspiracy when they encountered Marmot. The sorceress was informed that the evidence was destroyed, and the captain agrees with her. Kinzel states that it appears that Marmot became the dog of the Grand Duchy of Pesilos. When Croft survived in the East and began to investigate the affairs of his mother— he found out that all the evidence was connected with the Grand Duke of Penzilos. However, the problem is that evidence is difficult to find because the Grand Duke hid the truth for years. Blake asks the captain what they will do now. Croft answers that it doesn't matter since the Emperor can kill the Empress thanks to false evidence, and he asks if they think that they can't cope with some great duke. Croft says he was curious why he wanted to get rid of his mother, the prince wanted to prove that the accusations against her were false. However, he does not understand why this matters now, since there are five days left before the coronation. The prince will become emperor and lead the Duke of Pezilos to the most terrible death. Riviera asks the prince if Kinsel is okay. Croft replies that she will sleep for a while because she needs to regain her lost energy. However, she couldn't sleep, so she pestered you to pat her on the head. The young lady says that it was not difficult for her at all, because Kinzel's hair is beautiful and she enjoyed stroking it. Hearing about this, Croft bent his head towards the girl and said that his hair is black light. Hey, let her stroke it as much as she wants. The surprised lady at first could not understand why she should do this. However, after stroking the hair, they thought it was quite good. Croft thinks with pleasure that it would be better if the princess stroked him all day. The young lady claims, turning to his highness, that she does not understand what this situation is at all. The prince replies that they will train in martial arts. Croft explains that a person's weakness is usually located in the center of the body. He points his finger at the crown of the forehead and nose, chin, 
neck, and solar plexus. They will slowly learn everything else later. The gentleman claims that the most effective way is to start with the solar plexus. Riviera thought that this man was serious. The prince points to his chest and asks what needs to be done here. The lady replies that you need to use your fist. At this time, Croft asks if he can dodge by putting his left foot back. The princess replies that she can follow him and strike with her left hand. The prince asks what if this time he deviates to the right. The girl says that she needs to first grab the ego by the collar. Croft suggests that the girls just try to do what he said. Moving on to a fight, the guy dodges all the time, and Riviera can't hit him and thought that this was annoying her. Suddenly, the prince grabs the girl and thinks about whether he should hug her right now. The lady hits the prince in the chest with all her might and says with pleasure that she hit it. Croft pretended to be in pain, and the worried girl asked if he was okay. After catching his breath a little, the guy asks if her hand is okay. The princess replies that there is nothing wrong with her hand, but she is worried and asks how he is feeling. The gentleman says everything is fine, and he thought that she was worried about him. Croft says that he is in pain and looked at him. Riviera thought that his facial expression did not match his words. The girl apologizes, and the guy suggests that she not ask for forgiveness. The duke, taking advantage of this situation, hugs the girl and thinks that he cannot kiss her. Riviera asks his highness how she can resist such a situation. The prince offers to push her aside, and she says that she can't do it. Then he advises you to step on your foot or hit him between the legs, but then he realized that he had made a mistake. Croft asks for forgiveness. The girl says that she has forgiven him. However, she asks why he did this and if she is the first person to pet him. The princess says, turning to his highness, that despite the circumstances, it is impossible to hug so tightly. The duke says that for this, he asked forgiveness. Croft suggests sitting down first. The young lady addresses his highness and says that if after such words he immediately proceeds to action, then he may be misunderstood. However, she did not give him her consent to act. The duke tells her to answer now because he wants to hug the girl and asks if this can be done. Riviera replies that it is impossible and the surprised prince asks why. The young lady says that she wants to ask him a question about why the prince wants this. Croft says she smells nice and he likes her soft hands. I like her gaze directed at him. I like her voice calling him. The prince says that he likes the Riviera. When the princess heard about this, she thought what nonsense he just said. However, in a couple of days, when Lillian moves to the palace, a spark of love should slip between her and Croft. The main character reflects that during all this time of dating, she only beat him several times, and she is interested in the question of where the prince got feelings for her. However, if you think about it, she still felt sorry for him a couple of times, because there was a reason. The young lady doesn't understand what she needs to do. The princess turns to his ego highness, but after letting me say a word, he asks me to remain silent. Riviera thinks that this is the first time the prince has said something like that to someone, and she doesn't understand why. The young lady reports that she also likes him, but of course not in a romantic way, and asks if his feelings for her are the same. The princess reported that he would definitely meet his soulmate and life partner, who would give him a lot of love. Hearing these words, Croft was a little surprised, and the lady asked if he understood her. In the morning, when the maid was doing her makeup, the princess noticed that something was wrong with her and asked what was the matter. Zeroni replies that Lady Ilmenda will arrive here in a couple of days, and the worried maid says that she will no longer be able to help the princess do her makeup. Tomorrow, the main character of this world, the tyrant's companion, the pitiable unfortunate Lillian, will finally come to the palace. The princess thinks that it would be better if she came today, given the nonsense Croft is talking about, who has not yet seen the love of his life. Riviera imagines the prince hugging Lillian and telling her that these feelings no longer mean anything to him, and it's time for her to get out of the palace. Zeroni asks the lady if she can reserve the right to choose her outfits. The princess takes the maid's hand and says that without her, she would not be able to do anything until Zeroni herself decides to leave, and until then, she will remain her main assistant. Because these are not empty words. However, in her cute little head, there is no useful information that would help in everyday affairs. The maid with pleasure says that she will not envy or interfere with Lady Ilmenda. However, she doesn't need anything just to be close to the princess. 
The princess says that this lady will come to the palace because she and the prince are destined to fall in love with each other. However, she had no intention of making her her maid. Hearing this, the surprised Zeroni asks why there is a second lady in the courtyard to play the role of the bride if the princess has already been announced as the future empress. The maid asks if this is possible, and she says that the lady was probably very upset about this, but she didn't even know. Riviera suggests not to worry about it, how much she doesn't want to take a place next to the future emperor, and asks the question who told the maids that she was announced. Zeroni replies that people say that after the coronation of the prince, her wedding with him will also happen. Hearing this, the main character wonders if everyone around her thinks that she will become an empress and does not understand how she can bring Croft together with Lillian. Riviera tells Zeroni that she does not want to be empress. However, she likes the idea of His Highness and Lady Ilmenda starting a relationship because she blesses them with all her heart. The princess asks the maid not to believe the rumors that she will become the wife of the future ruler. Zeroni says that the prince is who he is, but still she thinks his feelings for the princess are real. The maid says that she will root for her success and let her not be discouraged. Riviera, hearing this, thought that if this was true, then it would only make things worse for her. The palace of the Imperial Palace, in which all 300 knights of the Imperial Guard, because Vindic's mercenaries arrived in full force yesterday. However, there are certainly Duke Pazilos's rats in the Imperial Guard. Therefore, it is necessary to remove them from the ranks of the main army and replace them with reliable mercenaries. In general, the prince's gang checked the background of all the soldiers. Twenty-two of them were linked to Penzilos. It is quite possible that he planned to carry out a coup d'etat with their help. The knight says among themselves that the princess rejected the captain. Blake says that apparently Lady Riviere is not to the taste of a man like the captain. Melek claims that the princess is beautiful, elegant, and sophisticated, and their commander is far from her. Chaster tells what people can hear and asks them to think about what they are talking about. Looking at the couple that arrived, Melek thought about what the captain was counting on with such a beautiful lady. The knight informs his highness that the guards are waiting for an order. He also greeted Lady Riviere and kissed her hand. Seeing this, Croft tells Blake to get rid of this knight. The guy says that he is not on the list of traitors, but the captain claims that he would have done it. Malik was appointed the new captain of the Imperial Guard. Fifty of Vindic's mercenaries were recruited into the ranks of the guards, and the previous ones were fired to maintain the same number of soldiers. And those who were associated with Duke Penzelos were also removed. When a new owner appears at the Imperial Palace, the entire inner circle of the ruler changes, because there must be people close to him in Croft's palace. Croft turns to the princess and kisses her hand. The surprised girl asks why he suddenly did this. The prince replied that the guy did the same. Riviera asks if he is talking about the captain of the guard. His highness says that he is already a former captain of the guard. Young lady explained that this is just a form of greeting which means that the person is glad to meet you. Croft says he is glad to see her every moment of his life. The prince worriedly asks the lady if she was close friends with him to be so happy about meeting him. Riviera answers that this is just part of etiquette and asks if she didn't teach him this. Croft claims that the more he learns about the rules of behavior, the more useless they seem to him. The lady suggests that he doesn't have to follow them if he doesn't want to. Suddenly, Melek informs the captain that the guys want to meet the princess. Riviera, giving his name, reports that his highness said that they are reliable people, and she welcomes them to the guard. Melek asks what the captain will order him to do. Croft answer that nothing needs to be done before his coronation. However, if they are bored, they can go on a spree. The main character thought that such informal communication between the captain and the knights could become a problem in the future. The young lady turns to Melek and says since he became the captain of the Imperial Guard, he needs to address the prince differently, since such communication between the future ruler and the commander of the Guard could greatly damage Croft's reputation. Rivera suggests that it would be better if in public he addressed the prince as Your Highness, and after the coronation as Your Majesty. Melek heard about this and agreed with the princess. The next day, news that Croft had reorganized the guard spread among high society. Pesilos, say that he was curious about how this idiot from the east would take control of the empire, and he started with the army. 
There were rumors among the aristocrats that Princess Blanche was rejecting the prince's courtship. However, she is predicted to become the empress. The aristocrats are talking about the fact that the daughter of the Duke of Blanche is a sophisticated lady who might not like a man from the East. Some aristocrats made barbs at the prince, others reflected on the future. Everyone thought about whether they could tie themselves into family ties with the emperor with the help of their daughters. Everyone secretly hoped that his daughter would steal the emperor's heart. Duke Blanche, talking to his daughter, says that after the death of her mother, he devoted all his time and energy to her. He promised to do everything to make her better, so he even refused to remarry. The father asks his daughter how dare she do this to him after all this. The main character thought that he raised her for money, but she would never admit it. Rivera turns to her father and says that she does not understand what he wants to say. The Duke invites his daughter to explain where these rumors came from. Blanche claims that his daughter decided to ignore the prince because he is considered a barbarian from the East. He asks if his daughter has decided to destroy this marriage. The young lady asks why he says this because the prince is a wonderful person. The girl thought about whether she was ignoring him or not because her life was at stake. Riviera thought that maybe people didn't know him well, but the prince definitely didn't deserve to be ignored. The main character asks who even dared to call Prince Barbarian from the East. However, she had just heard her father dare to say something rude about the man who would become the Emperor of Lewin. The aristocrats despised and at the same time rejoiced at the Emperor, who was completely unsuited for this role. Due to the fact that the ruler of the head of state had such a difficult past, the high society laughed at his ignorance of the basics of the Soviet way of life. The aristocrats hoped to take advantage of his stupidity and seize power. Those who sided with Croft also wanted to get theirs by manipulating the new emperor. Among them, the Duke of Blanche was the most prominent and took the most risks, and his ambitions surpassed any person from the nobility. Blanche, turning to her daughter, says that he understands her and thinks that he should not meet with the prince because he may have been mistaken about him. The father tells his daughter that he will solve everything and tells her not to worry. The main character does not understand in what sense he will decide and thinks that he can ruin everything. The servant informs the prince that Duke Blanche has asked him for an audience. The prince invites him and thinks that Herzog helped him, but he however talks too much. The count reports that the Marquis of de Forden has given his consent. This is why Blanche put a lot of effort into convincing him. The Marquis of de Forden is a man who was expelled from the empire because he, to the very end, expressed disagreement with the overthrow of Empress Letizia. And since then, this man lived in the forest in solitude. The prince, turning to the duke, says that he understands how much he does for him. Blanche addresses his highness with all due respect, but he would like to hear something more specific. Croft asks if he's talking about the reward because he knows he did a good job, and he himself thinks about what impudence this is. The Duke apologizes and asks how long the Prince plans to keep his daughter in limbo. Blanche claims that his daughter is in love with His Highness, and he can't just watch his little blood suffer because of unrequited feelings. Herzog Blanche says that His Highness should make his daughter his empress. The Prince reflects that before Riviere entered the palace, they made a secret deal. When the Prince agreed to these conditions, he believed that the Duchess would never want to marry him. He did not even think that the princess would begin to have feelings for him. Duke Blanche reports that if the prince is not going to marry his daughter, then he is no longer ready to support him. And of course he shouldn't expect support from the Marquis of de Forden. Having heard all this, Croft says that he will talk to Riviere. However, the duke insists that it is time to prepare the wedding ceremony. The prince replies that he needs to know her opinion since he cannot force the lady to marry him. Blanche asks in surprise what the prince is talking about since his daughter is head over heels in love with him. Croft says he understands and tells him to leave. The duke thought that he would now have to be tough, and he will arrange this marriage no matter what it costs him. After this conversation, the prince thinks that the duke clearly misunderstood something. After all, this simply cannot be, although he would really like to believe it. The prince reflects that Riviere will never change his decision because a few days ago he called the magician to certify that deal. The duke has an idea and is wondering if she will sympathize with him this time. The princess reflects on what her father said to Croft during the meeting. However, dad came out extremely dissatisfied, and the girl thinks that they had quarreled. 
However, the girl's thoughts were interrupted by the prince who came to her. Riviera asks his highness what is the matter, and he replies that it concerns the Duke of Blanche. The young lady asks what he told him. Croft says that if he doesn't marry her, he will lose all support. When the main character heard about this, she thought that her dad had gone completely crazy. The young lady thinks that Croft must be a tyrant, but now she looks like a puppy abandoned in the rain. However, the point may be that he is a prince with no real influence who did not even have a coronation ceremony. On his way to the throne, Croft was supported by about 50 mercenaries who came with him from the east and then became part of the Imperial Guard. This composition includes the young Prince Azen, who has enlisted the support of influential relatives on his mother's side, and also about the Duke of Pezalos, who has concentrated power in his hands, with whom Croft finds it difficult to compete. However, the prince now looks not like a feral mad dog, but like a puppy who may be thrown out into the street again. The main character thinks that she does not want to get married, but wants to leave this palace as soon as possible. But at the same time, she is disgusted by the idea that Croft will be deprived of everything he came to with such difficulty. The prince thinks that now he is between two fires, and even if he is left without support and again finds himself outside the walls of the palace, he could simply lead the Eastern Army and seize power as planned. Croft thinks that maybe it would be fairer this way, but then he won't get Riviere, and he will not achieve the revenge he wanted. The guy thinks that he needs a princess. His Majesty turns to the girl and says that the Duke said that Riviere is crazy about him, although she claimed to hate it. The princess says that her father never listens to what he is told, and she doesn't hate him. Hearing this, Croft takes the princess by the hand and says so, and offers to marry him because he likes her very much, and if he has to marry someone only her. The prince says if she becomes his empress, he will do everything she asks. The girl asks if he will notarize it. Croft asks what she wants to get by assuring this condition. The main character replied that it was nothing special, just let her promise that they could get a divorce at any time. And after that, he will be able to provide her with a comfortable and safe life. The surprised prince turns to Riviere and says that he has just proposed to her, and he asks if it seems strange to her to talk about divorce in such a situation. The main character claims that his highness will want a divorce more than she does, and she promises that she herself will leave the prince when the time comes, because it will even be beneficial for him. The surprised prince, hearing this, thinks about what is in the girl's head, since all these conditions are not natural even without the notarization of the magician just like the fact of turning to a magician. Croft realizes that this request is understandable, given that he is the son of a madman who killed his own wife with his own hands. The prince asks if she agrees to marry him if the agreement is officially certified. The young lady agrees with him. Croft is pleased to announce that the wedding ceremony will take place on the same day as the coronation, and he offers to make everything easier and faster. The main character thought that he was in too much of a hurry because the coronation ceremony would take place in two days. The princess claims that a lot needs to be prepared and at least clothes for them. Croft invites the girl to choose a date because he agrees to any day. The princess says that she will talk to the head maid and then inform him. The duke claims that if they decide on a date for the ceremony, they will announce it immediately. However, Duke Blanche will be informed in advance. Riviera says, turning to his highness, that she wants her father to be safe too. Because of Guilfred, his mother's second family also died. The blood shows that he understands that the princess does not trust him. However, he is not like him. The main character does not understand who the prince means. His highness addresses the girl and promises that she and her family will be safe. Lying in bed, the young lady cannot sleep. You think about the prince all the time. In the morning, Riviera asks the maid if the prince woke up. Zeroni replies that he is sitting in his office and she heard that he did not sleep all night. Hearing this, the main character was very surprised. Riviera came to the prince's office and at that time he became interested in why she had come. The young man thought that the lady could change her mind overnight. Croft looks at the girl and reflects that he could not even imagine that he would ever want to marry someone so much and he will do everything possible to take care of Riviere while she is with him. Her sympathy for the prince is as if he feels her sweetness on his tongue, because it always seemed to Croft that if he fought, he could achieve anything. However, he does not know what to do if the princess refuses. Riviera thinks it's because when he proposed, 
her words about divorce sounded a little harsh. However, this is due to the fact that he must not fall in love with someone before meeting Lillian. The girl thinks that maybe he really likes her. However, the main character cannot justify herself by saying that according to the plot, Croft will finish her off. The young lady turning to his highness says that she was rude to him because she didn't understand the depth of his feelings and upset him. And that's why he asks for forgiveness. Hearing this, the Duke did not really understand her message, but made his face even sadder. He replies that he understands because it is not easy to agree to marry someone like him. The main character objects and says that his highness is very charming. The saddened prince claims that she said about divorce when they are not even married. Riviera tells the prince that she believes that marriage is a union between people who love each other, and she would like everything in her life to be exactly like this. However, they do not know when such love will appear in their lives, and therefore leaving the opportunity for them to part without hurting each other. The young lady claims that they have only a temporary alliance to gain the support of her father. Croft looked at the princess and thought that this beauty was very mistaken, because he only wants Riviere Blanche as her father, and it's just funny to him because he doesn't believe in love. However, love can come to Riviere because she is a beauty, elegantly kind and infinitely sweet. And if love exists, then all the men in the world should love this particular girl. Duchess Blanche is a person with a kind heart who is able to sympathize even with him, so she will definitely be able to feel something called love. The young lady offers to do this if one of them has a loved one, then the second one with a light heart agrees to the divorce. And this way they will both be happy, and peace will reign between them and no one will suffer. Croft agrees with the princess, and he promises not to harm her and always protect her. And if she agrees with such conditions, he will call Kinsel so that she can assure them. The main character thought with pleasure that everything was decided. However, who would have thought that Croft would agree? The young lady thought that Lillian would arrive at the palace very soon. However, after she and the prince fall in love for everyone, there will be a happy ending. The duke remembers the lady's words and reflects that if such a person does not appear in her life, then this will not happen. Croft came into the sorceress's room and told her to get up. The magician asks who dared to wake her up. Seeing Captain Kinsel, he asks him if he has gone crazy because he decided to play with fire. The Duke explains that Riviere asked to call the magician to certify the contract and asks if he should turn to someone else. Seeing the sorceress, the princess thanked her because she had come and said that she had a request for Kinsel. The magician says that she missed her very much. However, the captain told her everything because she decided to magically certify the contract. The sorceress asks who the princess made a deal with. The young lady replies that with his highness. Kinsel asks the lady if she thinks the captain can deceive her and he suggests first casting a spell on him so that the prince speaks only the truth. The captain, turning to the sorceress, says that he hears everything. Riviera reports that this is not the case. However, she wants them to promise something to each other before their wedding. The sorceress asks if they have decided to enter into a marriage contract. Kinsel asks which condition will be the most important, because she can make him die the most painful death if he stops loving her. However, if he makes her cry, he himself will shed bloody tears until he dies. And if the princess suffers because of the captain, he will drown in the gutter. The magician asks whether to fill out all these items at once. Rivera reports that she just needs to confirm a few conditions regarding the divorce. Hearing this, the sorceress laughed, and she says that she understood because the princess needs the captain to agree to the divorce at her first word, and he asks the question whether she wants 90% of the property to go to her. Hearing this, the princess objects. Kinsel claims that her love for them prevents her from thinking straight, and she assumes that the princess still wants to get everything. The duke explains that if Riviere meets someone he truly loves, they will divorce. Croft claims that for his part, he promises not to harm her, and is also obliged to do everything possible so that the princess lives happily and calmly after the divorce. The prince claims that this is all Kinsel's conditions. The sorceress asks in surprise what kind of nonsense this is, and she does not understand then to certify such obvious conditions. Kinsel invites the lady not to let the captain fool her, and after the divorce, all the property was transferred to the princess. However, the young lady claims that what the prince said is enough for her. Hearing this, the sorceress says that she is so generous, kind, and slightly naive. 
The magician agrees because the two of them want it. However, she cannot assure words such as happiness or peace because their meaning is too vague. Kinsel argues that conditions prohibiting causing any harm should also be taken with extreme caution. Hearing this, Croft turns to the sorceress and asks if she thinks that the princess can kill him with her small fists. Kinsel replies that it seems to her that Riviera wouldn't even break a chicken's neck. The sorceress asks if the princess wants to enter into a marriage contract with the captain, according to which, if she falls in love with someone, she will leave him. The magician says that he understands her fear, since this mad dog can harm her. However, no matter what, she needs to ensure her safety. Rivera objects and says that is not the reason, because the prince can find the one he likes, and she wants the prince to have a chance to be with his true love. Kinsel reports that she will certify the contract. However, it will take effect immediately after magical activation. The sorceress argues that since they have not yet married, it will therefore be difficult to assure the terms regarding the divorce. She decides to do everything after the wedding ceremony. The magician says that in this case she will go on sleeping, and asks to wake her up on the wedding day as she will set off the festive fireworks. The princess turns to the sorceress and says, since she has already woken up, she can take part in the coronation, which will take place tomorrow. Kinsel, hearing this, laughed and said that she specifically wanted to sleep through this boredom. Riviera, looking at the prince and seeing his pitiful appearance, says that she is not going to leave him now. Hey, his highness replies that he trusts her completely. On the day of the Dionyl ceremony, Pesalos asks Lillian if she's worried. He reassures his sister and says that he will visit her. The girl replies that she is still not calm. Dionil, walking with his sister, wonders if she can win the favor of this man and take the place of the empress. He looks at his sister and thinks that she should get as close to Riviere Blanche as possible. The brother does not understand what his father was thinking. However, it is possible that Lillian will cope since she is famous for her beauty. Lady Riviere joyfully greeted Lillian. The main character invites her maid of honor to feel at home. And looking at her, the princess thinks that she is very worried. The main character looks at Lillian and thinks that she will make a man out of Croft and give it to her. Dionil asks his sister if she will introduce him to the princess. Lillian introduces her brother to the princess. Dionil thanks the main character for making Lillian so welcome, because he is touched by Riviera's kindness. The princess asks Lillian if she should leave them so they can say goodbye in peace. The surprised girl asks her brother if he wanted to tell her something. Dionil says that he will come to her often, but now he needs to return. He turns to the Duchess and says that he is glad to meet them. However, he asks her to be kind to his cousin. The main character invites her maid of honor to show her chambers and unpack her luggage, because she would then introduce Lillian to the prince at dinner. Riviera understands that the girl is clearly scared. However, there are many bad rumors about Croft that may have reached her. The princess reports that the prince can sometimes be quite harsh, but despite this, he is a very good person. In the evening, sitting at the table, the duke saw the ladies and thought that he was another uninvited guest. The princess introduced his highness Lady Lillian Ilmenda, who came to the palace to become her maid of honor. Lillian reports that it is most important for her to meet his highness. The main character, seeing that the duke was not doing what she taught him, thought that he was an asshole because she spent a lot of time on him. Riviera prompts the duke to kiss her hand and at this time he kisses her hand. The princess reports that his highness should invite the maid of honor to the palace. The main character speaks very quietly and warns that if he is not more polite to Lillian, then she will not have dinner or dance with him. However, the princess reminds him that she is still his etiquette teacher. Sitting at the dinner table, the main character thought that something was wrong, and she asks why it's so quiet here, like in a swamp. The main character understands that in the original novel, despite the social difference, a spark did not ignite between them at first sight. Riviera doesn't understand where she went wrong as her plan collapses. He noticed the saddened princess. Croft asks her if she liked the food. The main character thought that he should not ask her this. The princess asks Lillian if she likes these dishes. Suddenly, the maid of honor looked at the prince and thought that Duke Pizzilos was the coldest person she had ever met. Riviera asks the girl if she is okay. Lillian asks for forgiveness and leaves the hall. The prince says she has terrible manners. However, the main character remembers that the first impression that Lillian made on Croft should have been good. The duke invites the princess to sit down as the food is getting cold. The main character, turning to his highness, says that it seems to me that something is wrong with Lillian. 
The prince says that it doesn't matter, as long as the main thing is that she gets along well with her maid of honor. Croft turns to Riviere and tells her to listen to him since she has eaten practically nothing. Hearing this, the main character was very surprised because I showed her that Lillian did not hook him in any way. The princess suggests to his highness that if he wants to follow Lillian, then she will not mind. Croft says that even if they call him a mad dog, he will not chase the girl to finish her off for not following table etiquette. The surprised lady reports that she didn't quite mean it. The prince replies that there is no need for that now. The main character objects because this should never be done, and the prince agrees to her. Riviera asks if Lillian has become nervous because of his cold attitude towards her. She suggests that the prince be more friendly, because she taught him how to greet the ladies and asks why he didn't do that. Croft replies that this is how they greet ladies who are welcome, and asks if he has learned her lesson poorly, and he reports that he is not happy with Lillian. The princess thought that she was the love of his life, and he says that Lillian is his guest, and he should have been friendlier. Herzak replies that he has no reason for this, and he was polite in allowing Petsilos's niece to stay in the palace. The main character wanted to object, but in the original, Lillian received an order from the Duke to continue to see Croft despite the fact that she was afraid of him. However, it was on the orders of her uncle that she came to the palace as a maid of honor. The novel was sad because two enemies who could not be together fell in love with each other. Therefore, Lillian's reaction is quite understandable. But as soon as they met, a spark ignited between them and they fell in love. In the original, Croft went crazy every time he saw Lillian and the main character thought that something had gone wrong. Because a look always reveals people's feelings. The Duke reports that he is glad to see only her Riviere and asks if they will dance tonight. Suddenly, the main character realized that the reason was her. Concerned, Lillian, while in her room, reflects on the fact that the prince must like her and become an empress. She doesn't understand why you need to marry someone who can kill with just one look. And even more so, he has already given his heart to another. Suddenly, the chief maid enters the maid of honor's room, and she says that she heard that the girl left the table during dinner. The maid asks if the duke was angry when he learned about this. Lillian realized that there were already people in the palace who were watching her. The maid claims that the duke told her to think about her family, and she will not talk about what happened today, and invites the lady to try not to disappoint the gentleman in the future. Excited, Lillian thought that she had nowhere to run. Riviera heard that in ten days they would have a wedding. The young lady does not understand how it is possible to organize an imperial wedding in such a short time. Zeroni reports that His Highness said that the ceremony can be simple, so ten days will be enough for preparation. The main character thought that she simply wanted to quickly confirm the terms of the marriage before Croft fell in love with Lillian, and it seems to her that everything is going according to plan. The maid says that she heard that the dance rehearsal room is ready and asks the lady what she is doing. Riviera replies that she doesn't know if now is the right time to dance, because she can't even imagine dancing in such a situation. The princess asks the maid how Lillian is feeling. Zeroni answered that the lady did not leave her chambers. The surprised main character asks if the maid of honor has eaten properly, and he says that he will instruct the maids to take care of her. The maid claims that the mistress is incredibly kind. Seeing the princess, Croft asks if she heard that the wedding is in ten days. The young lady asks if there is any need to hurry, and he offers to postpone it to a later date. The duke heard this in objects because there is no need for this and there is not enough time. The princess thought and said that in general it could be done in a little more than a week. Croft thinks that she doesn't even know how much he's looking forward to this wedding, and she can't even imagine how much he likes him. He even agrees to a divorce if she meets someone she loves. The prince is ready to give anything just to kiss those lips. However, if she felt the same as he did, the duke, turning to Riviere, says that he wants to kiss her. But the main character objects to him. However, he asks her to dance. Riviera thought that Lillian should take his hand and not her. The main character was only looking for a way to survive, and not how to rewrite the original from beginning to end. She doesn't even know if she can accept Croft's love like a bomb. However, the main character does not want to become an empress. The place of the real Riviere is completely unsuitable for such an insignificant person like her. As long as the main character cannot accept Croft's feelings, she must give up this place. 
The princess thinks that she feels sorry for the duke because she is the first one who could sympathize with him. Croft asks the lady if she was angry because he wanted to kiss her. The princess objects to him and says that he is not at all. The princess understands that she did not want to see the sad prince with an empty, outstretched hand. However, she said that she was not angry with him and accepted the offer and took his hand. The main character is thinking about whether he will suddenly press her harder and bury his face in her neck, then she will run away. However, the situation is acceptable for now. Late in the evening, the prince heard his name called, and arriving in the main hall, he saw Duke Pezilos, who informs the prince that they have not seen each other for a long time. Er Herzog says that for now he can address him by name, and he is very happy to finally see how Croft has matured. The prince agrees with him and says that they really haven't seen each other for a long time. The uncle says that from childhood, Croft was like his father, and now it seems to him that the late emperor is sitting in front of him. Croft listens to the duke and feels threatened by his words. Pezilos claims that he has the same face as the man who killed his mother, and now he sits where he sat. Croft thought it would be easier to start a conflict right away, and he asks his uncle if he came here to die. The uncle replies that he is here for him, his nephew, and asks if he wants to restore the honor of the late Queen Letizia. Surprised, Croft reports that he did not expect to hear his mother's name from him because only rage and thirst for the place kept him afloat. Croft was in the East. He obtained all the possible information and tried to investigate the circumstances of his mother's death, but no matter what he did and no matter who he turned to, there were no results. Pasilos looked at his nephew and thought that if he had the opportunity, he would finish him off right now. However, the uncle reports that he recently received evidence that would restore Letitia's good name. Croft replies that he doesn't need any proof. The Pazilos claim that without them, no one will believe him. The prince replies that anyone will believe the emperor's statement. However, the captain wonders whether there was evidence against his mother in the past, because the emperor's suspicion alone was enough to kill the first woman of the empire, because he doesn't need proof to take revenge. Since Gilfred is already dead, it will be enough for Croft to cut the throat of the one sitting in front of him. However, will this be enough for his mother, who has never received an acquittal in the eyes of people? Pezilos says that he is not in the same position as his father was, and he asks whether the high society will believe him without evidence. The prince, claiming that he is not going to agree on anything with him, because the point of politics is to go towards what you want even if you don't like the path itself. The uncle says that his nephew forgets that, having become a ruler, he will also be responsible for other people, and their lives will depend on it. He gives an example of how much his precious Duchess Blanche, who in ten days will become his wife. Croft asks his uncle that his visit here is definitely not an elegant way to commit suicide. Pezilo says his life is also in Croft's hands, but if he dies today, his mother will always be remembered as the vicious empress, and his beloved Riviere Blanche, like those she loves, will never be safe. The prince tells his uncle to say what he wants. Pizzillo says to make Lillian a concubine and leave her in the palace, and that's all he needs. Croft reports that he doesn't know what his uncle hopes for, but it won't happen. Pizzillo's reports that everyone in the capital already knows that he is crazy about Duchess Blanche, and the uncle offers to rein in the princess's father, who imagines himself to be God knows what. The uncle says that when he settles Lillian, he will send him evidence that will help acquit his mother. Blake invites the prince to finish off his uncle, and if he only says so, then Pessilus will not have time to take two steps on the street, because Riviera has dear and beloved people, and the prince is sure that he can protect her, but he won't be able to protect the others even if he sends his squad to join them. Croft says that as soon as he becomes emperor, he will cut off his limbs and then strangle him. For seventeen years the prince dreamed of a place, he understands that nothing bad will happen if he waits a little longer. Chester asks his highness what to do with Pezilos' niece, and how can I explain this to the duchess? Malik suggests saying that the duke used threats to force the prince to make her his concubine, but Croft disagrees because Riviere does not need to know about this, as well as about many other things. During the meeting, after the visit to the Duke of Pezilos, it was decided to talk about everything honestly, because this is the right decision but they are not that close. When the princess entered the hall, she greeted the gentleman and said that today was a particularly good morning, but he was so gloomy and asks what happened. The prince reveals that he has decided to make Lillian Ilmenda his concubine. Hearing about this, 
the main character says that this is a great idea. And he thinks that, of course, the original plot could not have changed so easily. Riviera reports that she knew this would happen from the moment she first saw Lady Lillian, and he claims that this is a wonderful solution. The prince reflects that the lady does not love him, and he was still mistaken in thinking that they had become close. Croft felt as if his heart had stopped beating. The main character noticed that something was wrong and asked if his highness was okay. The prince replies that he is not fine. Riviera suddenly noticed that his face looked as if he was about to cry. The lady thought that something was hurting him. The princess asks whether to call the palace doctor or Kinsel. The lady comes closer to the duke and asks what is hurting him. Croft asks her if she is really worried about him. The lady replies that she is worried and asks her to tell him what is hurting him. I heard this and the duke says that in that case he is fine, and he takes the lady's wheel and kisses it. The prince claims that, be that as it may, she is his empress, and that's why everything is fine. The main character thinks that even though Croft was able to fall in love with Lillian, he still treats her in a special way. Zeroni asks the lady if she quarreled with his highness. The lady asks why this should happen. The maid says that there is no face on her, and that's why she thought that something had happened. The princess says that on the contrary, something good happened, because Croft fell in love with Lillian as in the original, but she cannot tell the maid about this. Looking at herself in the mirror, the princess remembered what Zeroni had said about how she looked unwell. However, she is in a wonderful mood now. The main character reflects that if Lillian becomes a concubine, she will not need to worry that Croft will harm her and think about an escape plan. Later, when Riviera leaves the palace, the maid of honor will naturally become the empress, and then relations with Pizzilos will improve, since his niece will be the empress. Then Croft will not become a tyrant. The princess realizes that based on the behavior she has seen, the prince will treat Lillian well and she will love him, just as in the original novel, and it will be a happy ending in which everyone will be happy. However, the main character thought that, for some reason, she was not happy. She realizes that she should talk to Lillian beforehand, because suddenly she would be embarrassed by such a sudden offer to become a concubine, and she might refuse. Riviera asks the maid if the lady is going to her chambers now. Zeroni reports that she is at a meeting with the duke's son in the living room, and the duke sent her a whole mountain of gifts. Surprised, Lillian asks Dionil if it is true that the prince wants to make her a concubine. The aristocrat replies that her father again told her all sorts of things and that she should not worry, because soon she will become an empress, because her father has high hopes for her. Dionil suggests winning the prince's heart and not worrying about trifles. The worried maid of honor reports that she does not want to be a ruler because the prince is so scary. However, the brother claims that she will become the most noble lady of the Lewin Empire. He asks if it is possible to say such nonsense when so many people do everything for her. The brother suggests that people hurry up so as not to be late for the coronation. Dionel reports that all these jewels from his father will make Lillian the most beautiful girl of the Blanche family. The temple was filled with the singing of a choir of bishops from the holy city of Linton Garden. In front of the eyes of people pursuing their own goals, he became the 17th ruler of the Louvain Empire. The emperor, addressing his subjects, says that they all probably know that he grew up in the East, because everything is arranged there so that you give twice as much as you receive. However, he may become wild, but he will be a fair ruler. Croft reports that loyalty will be rewarded, and you will have to answer for the spilled blood of others with your own, and this applies to everyone without exception. The aristocrats greeted the emperor and shouted long live his majesty the emperor Louvain. Croft thought that if his mother were alive, she would be more happy than the rest, because he was able to achieve this. The main character thought that today is really a very happy day, and she wants to share this joy with the emperor. The emperor approaches Riviere and says that she is his empress. The lady thought about it since she had not yet married him, and suddenly Lillian would see this and misunderstand. Riviera understands that it is impossible to reject his hand and disgrace him in front of everyone. However, the emperor takes the lady by the hand, and she says that she is not yet an empress, but is already walking with him. Croft claims that he sees nothing wrong with this. Riviera thinks that he would probably like to hold Lillian's hand now. But judging by the way he shows respect for her, despite his feelings for the maid of honor, he will treat his future empress with dignity.
When the emperor walked away to express his respect to the guests, and at that time, Riviere saw her father, Blanche tells her daughter that the emperor is going to make Pedzalos's niece his concubine. The daughter asks how her father found out about this. Blanche tells Riviera not to worry because the emperor only loves her. The father says it's obvious that Duke Pazilo simply decided to rein in their family. Since the emperor only loves her, everything is fine. And this is what will save their family. Blanche says that she is too generous to the new ruler, but still, he will talk to him. The main character realized that her father was concerned about political ambitions, not his daughter. Riviera objects to his father and says that this is not necessary. Blanche calms her daughter and says no matter how influential Petzilos is, the emperor will always be grateful to Blanche's family. Pezilos enters the room and says that he has come to welcome them too, away from the crowd, and it seems to him that he interrupted the conversation between father and daughter. The duke reports that thanks to Blanche, the emperor was able to take the throne, and as his uncle, the duke of the empire, he is quite grateful. The main character thought that he had really come to thank them. However, Croft quickly falls in love with Lillian, and so she thought that she and Petzilos would soon make up, but apparently that's not the case. Blanche reports that each of them received benefits. Since his nephew became emperor, his daughter will soon become empress. Uncle claims that the new emperor is very similar to his late predecessor, because they are similar not only in appearance, but also in character. Petzilos asks if Croft will do the same as his father in the future, and if it were him, he would be worried about the fate of his daughter.